One of the biggest heartbreaks is hearing stories of women who have been in relationships sacrificing for the family year after year, only to find themselves alone and broke decades later because their partner took all of their money and left them for someone younger and hotter. Now, whether you are single or in a relationship, how do we keep getting trapped in these power dynamics? Because oftentimes when you are going into a relationship, I hate to say it, but it can be quite transactional, right? Uh, you say, hey, I will be the homemaker. I will take care of our children. I will take care of all of the household duties, do all of that unpaid and frankly undervalued labor while, you know, in a heterosexual relationship, the man goes out, he is the breadwinner, he has the nine to five job and he brings home money. The problem is, is there is a division of labor. It's not like the wife who's staying at home is just hanging out and eating bonbons all day, they're certainly doing very hard labor. Labor that I personally now as a business owner and someone who's very busy outsource and try to get other people to help me with. And I pay them money to do that. However, when it's your home and your kids, the expectation is that the woman does that for free. And in a lot of traditional marriages where maybe there wasn't a prenuptial agreement where you'd say, hey, if something were to happen, I would get a certain financial payout because I've done all of this unpaid labor and I've put my career on hold, you end up in a situation where one person leaves the relationship having a full tenured career and the money that comes with that. And the other person leaves in a really, really precarious financial situation. Mm. And it totally sucks. Mm. If you find yourselves, no matter what age you yeah. are, and you realize the reasons why we get trapped, I think that's super important. I think you very much beautifully articulated it. How now do we then pivot or change? And now let's take someone who is, in fact, your perfect example. When okay. you first met your fiance, yeah. he was making a lot more money than mm -hmm. you. And so did you talk about it originally while he was making more money than you? Yeah, we had to. Um, so funny enough, uh, this is like a New York City love story, by the way. Uh, when we were dating, we had been dating for roughly three weeks. Uh, we hadn't even had the, what are we conversation yet. And I moved into an apartment with my girl roommate at the time. We lived together for a year. We moved into a new apartment. Long story short, apartment ends up being a roach infested mess. Just like they're in the walls, they're in the <gasps> pipes. One of them died in my ice tray, which is just so foul. I was like, get me out of here. I need to be completely just out of this place. And we had to talk about money very early on in our relationship out of necessity because the rent on that place was a touch over $4,000 a month. And to break our lease, even though of no fault our own, it was a roach motel, we didn't know this, was $8,000. And I had only been working for a full calendar year. I didn't have that much you know, extra money set aside. I still had to keep paying rent while my stuff was basically in a storage mm. unit crawling with bugs. And I essentially moved in with this man that I'd known for three weeks. And I had to be really candid with him and say, I, I can't afford to pay you to stay at your apartment while paying my rent, while also making sure that I have enough money to break my lease the next month. And not can I not afford to just pay you? I, I can barely afford for us to go out to dinner and split it. I certainly can't afford to pay for vacation. Forget it, like on all of that stuff. And at the time, he was making two, three times as much as I was. And he never made me feel bad about it. He never made us feel like we were on uneven footing. We were always equals. We were always partners. And he picked up the lion's share of our expenses. All of those dates he paid for. All, like, I think the one, uh, there's like four dinners a year that I would pay for and they'd be like, his birthday <laughs> or like our anniversary. I'd pick it up. I'd be like, oh, let me pick up the bill. He's like, you know, I've paid for dinner the last 300 dinners we went to. Um, he paid for most of our vacations when we were going on vacation. He paid for all of it. And I like to call him the world's greatest angel investor mm -hmm. because I wasn't making that much money at the time. But he always believed in me. He was the one who encouraged me to leave Wall Street, go into media and tech. He was the one who encouraged me to leave media and tech and take Your Rich BFF full time. And nowadays I make four to five times as much as he does. And I am so lucky 
in being able to do that. But I have been very cognizant to also stay very fair in the way that I treat our expenses because if it were the other way around, he'd be paying for even more stuff. So now I pay for the lion's share of our expenses and all of the money, you know, we are getting married in June. I'm very excited. Um, And we are drafting a prenup where every single dollar going in to our marriage, so every dollar I've made, every dollar he's made, um, will be 50-50. And every dollar that we make in our marriage is also 50-50. And the only thing that's carved out is ownership, the equity stake in my business. Mm. Because if something were to happen, I would want us to be able to part ways. That money is joint money. I have no hard feelings of him taking half of my money. But I don't want to have my business tied to an ex-partner who may make it hard for me to sign with management or take on a brand deal or make decisions about my business that I built. So when we say prenup, it's not one person being left destitute and one person being left a bajillionaire. It's truly making a smart decision for your relationship as it currently stands. All right. There's so many questions I have to ask. We're going to go deep because that story, I think, encompasses what people struggle with the confidence to speak up, the ability to articulate with your partner, the fact that you kind of almost gave yourself over. You left an apartment and were like, I hope this guy after three weeks doesn't emotionally abuse me, throw me out. Like there's so much risk that went into Uh, that. I mean, first off, I was 24 at the time. So my frontal lobe was not fully developed. (laughs) But two, I didn't think through any of those consequences, by the way. I, I just wanted to get out of my apartment with all of those freeloading, six-legged, eight-legged roommates. Mm -hmm. I did not want to be there. Mm -hmm. And I was so lucky because my roommate at the time also moved in with her boyfriend at the time. Mm -hmm. And after the the following month, we broke our lease and we still decided to move in back together, her and I. But seven years later, I'm now, you know, a couple months out from marrying my partner. Mm -hmm. And the day she moved out of her boyfriend's apartment, they broke up. She broke up with him. Okay. So you even (laughs) said, right, as I was about to say, you even said, yeah, I didn't even think through all that because you were young. No. That's my point. Yeah. If someone young is listening right now, they're not thinking through it, homie. Absolutely not. So talk to me about the potential dangers then of what could have happened. And then obviously the fairy tale that ended up, but there's so many possibilities where you're young, you don't think about it. You end up moving in. The guy says the right thing. And then to my point, 20 years later, you're like, I can't believe when I was young, I didn't bring this up from the beginning. Because usually it's easier, right, to bring things up earlier on in a relationship yeah. than five years down the line. I mean, you move in with a partner and, you know, you start to get rid of your own furniture. That's the, that's the first thing. If you were to leave, you have to now buy all this new furniture. Furniture costs money. And that's a very, very tangible thing. Also, you start storing your stuff at their apartment If you come home one day and the locks are changed and your name's not on the lease, all of your stuff that's in that apartment is now theirs. Like legally theirs, right? Legally, it is on the premises of a building that is in their name, that is being rented out to their name. You're not on the deed. You can't even legally claim ownership of being there. You can be kicked out at any time. That's scary, right? But also the more subtle stuff. Um, Listen, I don't want to blow up anybody's spot, but like, My roommate, when she went to go move in with this guy, he would like ignore her. He would hang out with his friends until all hours of the night. Like he was not a good partner. He was not respectful. He never checked in on her, even though we were both going through like a pretty tumultuous time, right? To rip out that much money out of our bank accounts to break our lease. And also the emotional turmoil of hiring movers and scheduling time away from work that wasn't for a vacation or anything fun. It was just to go move out of our apartment. Like, I feel like I got the best case scenario. And I do in some instances feel like she got the worst. And I truly do feel bad about that situation. It's also the, like, I don't want to say it's emotional abuse, but like when you're with someone who isn't supportive of you, who isn't there for you when you really need them, like, over time you start to internalize it and you build up that scar tissue and you don't think you deserve it anymore. Mm. And things can get so bad that you start to think they're the norm. 
and you don't even realize what else is out there or what types of people are out there who would love you the way you are supposed to be loved and treat you the way you are supposed to be treated, both from a financial perspective, but also just a you know supportive, compassionate person, human being one. I hate to see young people get themselves into precarious situations where they are setting a negative precedent for themselves, where their expectations are lowered based on what they've been dealt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was literally where, where I was going to go, is thinking about how much that impacts how we feel about ourselves, our self-worth, and then how we then show up maybe in the na that next relationship. And I just want to say, neglect is absolutely emotional abuse. It's 100%. And so when I think about how sh your friend may have learned the wrong lesson, right? Let's say she moves on to another relationship. You end up, to your point, is that you see a certain behavior and you end up thinking it's normal. But because of your beautiful story that it didn't end up like that, I love having that like North Star that you can kind of yes. look to, to be like, oh, okay. The problem sometimes though, is that we then compare and without knowing, and I really want to break down how you spoke to your fiance, how you guys, you know, manage it so that we can give people the language and words to use so that they don't fall back into that low self-worth trap mm -hmm. that I think a lot of us get into that then leaves us without money or finance or any security. Um, so you said about how you brought it up because of the apartment. Yeah. But then you moved out, right, with your friend. So then um, as your boyfriend was actually making more money, how did you feel about him treating you to dinner every day? Because I think a lot of people then worry, well, if I get used to it and then they take it away, uh, then, yes. <laughs> so, then, so then they don't want to get used to it. And yeah. so now you hear a lot of women that literally say, I don't want the guy to pay on the first date. And so now it's causing, causing so many complexities of confusions on yeah. dates and stuff. But um, yeah, how do you think about that? You know, I also had this thought. I was like, what if I get used to it and then we have to start splitting like, and then I'm going to feel some type of way about this. Fortunately, I haven't. He's never, ever, I, there are times that I leave the house, no phone, no ID, no wallet. It's just like me and a lip gloss and we are just living life. Um, but I will say that like the conversation around money is one that we want to be having earlier. I when we first started dating, he was doing the chivalrous thing, like chivalry is not dead. He paid for mm -hmm. the couple first dates. When we, it was clear that we were going to keep seeing each other. I actually said to him, I was like, hey, I think like we should alternate dates back and forth. You pay and then I'll pay. And he actually made a really good point. He was like, well, I make a lot more money than you. So how about you can pick up every third or fourth date? Mm -hmm. And to me, that was representative of something that I encourage everybody to take into their relationships. We are not looking for equality ever. We are looking for equity. So say you and I are in a relationship and you make half a million dollars a year and I make $50,000 a year. When we go and get an apartment together, we should not be splitting rent 50, 50 down the middle. Just because that's equal, it doesn't mean it's equitable. And it's certainly not fair because rent is now a much larger burden mm -hmm. and per percentage of my total spending and my take home pay than it is of yours. So I think we need to be less focused on, is everything fair? Is this a 50-50 relationship? Because I don't ever want a 50-50 relationship. Some days my partner is 70 and I'm 30. And some days I come to the table with 80% of the energy and he is running on low, mm -hmm. running on 20. And that is okay. We figure it out because we have 100%. But if you are always looking for a partner who's only willing to give 50 on any day that you have less than 50, you don't have 100% together as a team. Mm. Girl, I've got some amazing stats. I went down into your world deep into what mm -hmm. you talk about, why it's important. And then this just really freaking echoes everything you're saying and why people absolutely right now need to pay attention to this episode and what you're you're going to be telling us. So couples that argue about finances are at least, at least once a week mm -hmm. are 30% more likely to get divorced. That's a huge percentage. Once a week. Yeah. 30%. Yeah. That's insane. Women suffer um, more financially through divorce than yeah. men. So one study showed that their standard of living can drop by almost 50%, while a man's standard of living typically drops around 20%. Don't you think that's funny though? Because in every single pre, like no prenup divorce story, they're like, oh, this man who's worked so hard his entire career is now destitute. And his wife who hasn't done anything is a multi-billionaire. Mm -hmm. Like this picture that we've been painted through like pop culture tropes and caricatures of what actually happens it is not actually reflective in the statistics and the actual research. Like 
The frequency at which that happens, the scenario that I just described happens, is rare. If, you know, very, very infrequently. The scenario that you're describing, we know from the numbers is that oftentimes when divorces happen, women are left in the much more vulnerable position. Mm -hmm. That's why I really wanted to start this interview there because I thought if we if we don't know A, what we're doing to then potentially cause this as a knock-on effect and as a result, if we end up getting divorced, I don't want people 20 years from now wishing they'd done something now. Thousand percent. And then to think about then where we end up as women, where now, I've, I've, I hate this. I'm the biggest advocate for women. So the fact yes. that I'm saying this, it pains me to say it, but it's true. So we're now older, right? So imagine you've been, <laughs> you imagine you've been yeah. you know, a stay-at-home wife yeah. or a stay-at-home mother, which is a beautiful, like you yes. said, one of the hardest jobs in the world. So imagine you've been doing that for 20 years. Now you're in your 40s or your 50s. Your education, your skill sets that is required in the job world mm -hmm. out to there, you may be behind the eight ball because things Correct. change so much. Correct. So now think about you're behind the eight ball. You're now already older, which again, I hate it, but people judge you people when do. you're older. There, I'm so sorry, but there are jobs that people are not going to hire you for if you are in your 40s or 50s or 60s because those are deemed jobs for 20-year-olds. And ageism is so real in the workplace. Mm -hmm. It is very, very hard. If you just even go through some major company pages, you can like figure out who they are. When you look at social media managers, they're all in their 20s. You're lucky if you're in your 30s. You're gonna hire someone who's 50 to be your social media manager? What do they know about social media? There are these inherent biases of what you think a 50 year old would be good at. And if they don't have those years of experience under their belt, like they're really starting from ground zero and they're not going to be getting a job that necessarily ties to what they need to feel really fulfilled and appreciated in the workplace. Now add on to top of that, that you're female. So oh, you even said, I've heard you talk one about- too. Yeah, like you in Wall Street, when, wasn't it like you had the boss that was like asking you to be less girly? Oh my God. Can you imagine asking me to be less of something that is an inherent trait of mine? Didn't like the fact that I wore makeup at work, didn't like that my nails click clacked on the keyboard, yeah. didn't like anything about me because I wasn't like every other junior he had working for him. Mm -hmm. So now imagine you're, you're in your 40s and 50s, you're behind the eight ball, you're trying to now get a new job because you're 50%, according to this stat, right? You're 50% less, uh, uh, worse off than yeah. your partner who's 20% is just... I mean, also, when I was working on Wall Street, there was a program that was like essentially a return to work program. So mm -hmm. it would be a program for moms who had maybe taken a decade off of work or had worked as analysts or associates on Wall Street doing financial work and then took a break to raise a family or take care of the home and then they were coming back. Mm -hmm. And they would come back, you know, just a few levels, a level or two above me. And the way people spoke to them, it, it gives me the ick, mm -hmm. like as if they're not worthy of being there, as if, you know, just because they're in that position or using that program, they didn't deserve the seat mm -hmm. or they aren't qualified for the role and they got it just because of it was a diversity hire. But you don't hear people saying that about the men we hire from the military. Mm -hmm. They come into Wall Street programs that are like, you know, the military recruiting program to hire top talent who may be a little bit older into these younger seats. You never hear anybody say that about the men that we're hiring. But the moms, the moms who have to go leave at 6.30 to go pick up their kid or do something, because again, women are doing a lot of that unpaid labor, even if their partner is a work, a, you know, a person who's working outside the home and they're working outside the home, they're still doing more of that unpaid labor. People speak to women, especially older women, as if they're invisible. I just really wanna let that sit for a second. Yeah. That's really heartbreaking. Yeah. And sometimes it does feel like if you are not a conventionally attractive woman, you don't get even the meager benefits those that subset of women get. Yeah. Here's the thing. It is true that that happens. Yes, of course. It's unfortunate. Mm. God. Yeah. Oh, my God. Girl, you blew my mind already. Um, okay, I've got some more stats for Let's you. Let's do it. 41% of divorced Gen Zers and 29% of boomers say they ended their marriage due to disagreement about money. Back in my grandma's lifetime, there was a point that she could not have legally had a bank account 
that did not have a man tied to it. Why? How is she going to leave? Go where? Go where? She has no money. She doesn't have a bank account. She doesn't have a credit card with her name on it. Where is she going? Divorce didn't happen back in the day because people very literally could not afford to leave. Mm. My bet is that this is based on now. So that mm-hmm. in the 60s and 70s, yes. they're actually divorcing. Yeah. Because to your point, well, so A, the stats just go up. I think it's, I've actually got that this written down as well. I believe it's 69% of divorces are initiated by women. Now, if that goes even higher mm-hmm. if you're over the age of 45. Mm. So now think about the boomers who spend their whole life serving the family, going back to where we started, serving the family, serving the kids. They they don't have they're sick of the shit. They don't have the bank account, <laughs> and now they're like, it's fucking twenty twenty two or twenty three or four, whatever I'm year free. it is. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so now almost they find the confidence. And I'm going to be freaking honest with you, it's because of people like you as well. Thank That's you. why it's so important for me Thank to you. have you on this show. It's your voice, the message Thank that you're you. giving is allowing women of all ages, from the young, where it's like, hey, before you get into a relationship. Before while you're single, think about how you're going to approach a prenum with your next partner or with a partner you end up with. I think that's super powerful. But also your messages for the older generation that now is feeling lost and they don't know what to do. They are later on in their age and they have zero money to their, you know, um, their bank account. To your point of that, mm-hmm. it's because of the generations and the way that we've lived and the um, expectations that we've had. How do we then actually start to address that? You mentioned prenums. Do you suggest prenums even, because I always think about prenums as being for the extremely wealthy. Mm -hmm. No, hear me out. If you don't write a prenup yourself, you still get one. The government just gets to write it. And again, personally, I'm not a fan of letting the government dictate much about my life. I wanna make those choices myself. And when your marriage is dictated by the legislature of your state, maybe that's not necessarily how you want things to go. Mm. And frankly, if there is a large differentiation in terms of finances, I would want to make some things very, very clear going into the relationship. You don't need to have a ton of money to have a prenuptial agreement. This is literally a document you put together with your partner on a good day, on a sunny day, where you are feeling good about each other, you have nothing but love and positivity for each other, that's going to say, this is how things will be divided if something were to go wrong. Because guess what? We buy health insurance, we buy car insurance. There's absolutely no reason not to have marriage insurance. Mm. And frankly, I have heard no people, zero people, ever complain saying, darn, I wish I didn't get a prenup. The number of people who say the opposite and they haven't gotten Mm -hmm. one, they don't have any sort of documentation to take care of them financially, everybody regrets that. So I would say everybody should get a prenup. Everybody. Uh, So what holds us back then from the beginning of actually even asking or even thinking about prenup? So actually take us back before you even think about prenup. How? So you've explained how we get into the problem. Why on earth do we get into that power dynamic? If you're working damn hard to kick ass and be unfreaking stoppable, there's one thing I know for a fact that you need to actually show up confident and ready for anything, and that's sleep. That's why I want to introduce you to the secret to better sleep, Cozy Earth. Cozy Earth's luxury bedding products are crafted with temperature regulating technology, so you're not waking up covered in sweat and then shivering 10 minutes later. And they use super soft and breathable materials that literally feel like a cloud when you're sleeping. I'm officially obsessed. They are literally the softest sheets I've ever felt. And so I definitely would recommend giving Cozy Earth a try. Treat yourself right now to ultimate comfort with Cozy Earth bedding and make your sleep a priority so that you can actually show up every day with confidence and kick ass. Click the link below or head over to CozyEarth.com and use the promo code LISA to save an exclusive 35% off right now. Upgrade your nights, transform your days with Cozy Earth. Think about it, it's awkward. You don't wanna be called a gold digger. You don't wanna be told that, oh, you only like me for my money. And so women oftentimes very much downplay our need for financial security because we've been literally brainwashed into thinking that if we want financial security or we want stability in our lives, we want wealth, it makes us greedy, it makes us gold diggers, and it makes us shallow. But guess what? That same man that you appreciate for having a certain level of financial Mm -hmm. stability 
wouldn't date you, wouldn't marry you if you didn't look a certain way, if you didn't take care of yourself a certain way, if you didn't have certain skills or offer certain things about your personality. What makes it wrong to have that be a trait that you look for in partners? Mm. I am very much one to think, hey, this isn't a situation where you are jumping from richer person to richer person to richer <laughs> person, of course. You need to actually love someone for who they are, but it is equally as easy to love someone who has their finances in check as it is to love someone whose finances are not in check. Mm -hmm. And my opinion of it is when you are starting to date someone seriously, like talking about money is going to save your relationship because there are stats out there that show sex and money are the top two reasons why couples fight. And knowing that, you know, in the US, the divorce rate is nearly half, 50%. Wouldn't you want to address the top two reasons that you and your partner would fight? So you obviously want to make sure your intimacy is in a good place and you obviously want to make sure your finances are in a good place. Mm -hmm. That's so strong. So with you and your boyfriend, as you started to discuss this, it obviously seems like you had somebody who was very receptive to talking through that. To I'll say this. Guys in finance go one of two ways. You either have the type that wants a partner they want a power player standing next to them, climbing to the top of the mountain. And I'm lucky, that's what I have. Yeah. Then there's a, a massive population of, I would say, high earning, high powered men who want women who are going to take a back seat, who aren't going to outshine them, who are happy to play the supporting character. And in some people's lives, that is great. It mm -hmm. works for them it would never have worked for me. And I think that's such a beautiful key point to make is that there's zero judgment. Like not everybody wants to be that. People sometimes do want to take the back seat. Like I don't want to be yeah. in that hustle. I no. love my life. And so yeah. if that's a life, freaking respect, but know who you are and not take the back seat because your Correct. partner said you should. Correct. And let me tell you, you can fake anything for three months. There, I have had whole completely different personas, personalities. I was a completely different person. I love sports at one point because I was dating this one guy and I was like, oh my God, I'm such a sports I don't know anything about sports. I hate sports. I don't, I don't know what the score is. I don't know the rules. I don't know anything. I'm here for- But you're still cheering. I'm here for a corn dog and a, 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 a bag of popcorn. But like, you can't fake it for much longer than three months. And after that point, if you are a power, you know, a power hustler and you are pretending to play a supporting character, or if you want to be a stay-at-home parent or stay-at-home, you know, mom, and you're trying to pretend like you have this huge passion, it's it's going to show through. Mm -hmm. You are not going to be able to fake it forever. Truly embrace who you are and what you want out of life, because there tr there is somebody out there who wants the exact puzzle piece fit for you. Mm. So if you had found that your boyfriend was getting jealous, let's say, as your, as your success mm -hmm. started to build. Because this is why I'm like, I'm mm -hmm. taking it bit by bit, girl, because your story is fucking fascinating of how you still end up together. And that's why mm -hmm. it's so beautiful. But it's a hard transition. So as you started to build your own career, your own success, your own wealth, how did he respond? And then take me through an opposite response mm -hmm. that he could have had, and then what you would have done if that had happened. Yeah. My fiance has always been my biggest cheerleader. Mm. The person who, oh, this is just the perfect example. He's very, he's a quite a bit more reserved than I am. Like I'm very gregarious, very outgoing. Um, the person who shows up to the dinner party with, you know, a bottle of champagne is like, everybody, you know, hello. <laughs> he's the wallflower. I had a billboard go up in Times Square and he sent me a photo of the, photographer that was hired to take photos of me and this billboard, he sent me a photo of him taking a photo of the photographer. And I was like, wait, you were there? You didn't even say hi. And he was like, oh yeah, like I just wanted to see you in your glory and I didn't want to distract you from your work. And I was like, for this person to take 15 minutes out of their incredibly demanding job to literally walk over to what I consider the armpit of New York City to just be there with me, even if I didn't know he was there with me, that's a level of support you can't ask for. Mm -hmm. Like they just have to proactively want to do it. On the flip side, when I started making a lot more money, my mom actually told, my mom is Chinese immigrant, very, very old school. She was like, you should lie. 
about how much money you make. To your partner. Yeah, yeah. She was like, make, like, just take a zero off. Like, just don't, don't lie. And I was like, why would I do that? And she was like, well, men don't like it when you make more money than them. And I'm like, well, mom, men of your era may have not liked it when you made more money than them. But she was probably right. In many cases, I think my partner certainly could have gotten very jealous, felt emasculated, felt like, you know, they weren't the big man in the house anymore. But I do think that's changing quite a bit um, with the rise of the stay at home dad, but also with the rise of a I would say it's like a renaissance of the happily mm. ever after because in generations prior, the happily ever after was nuclear family, two and a half kids, white picket fence house, golden retriever, tire swing out front. I love the tire swing. Tire swing. You know, that's like so <laughs> yeah. Americana. But now happily ever after looks so different. And the thing that makes me laugh the most is when my partner says, I, when I, I asked him, I was like, does it make you uncomfortable that I make more money than you do now? He goes, no. Why would it make me uncomfortable? You think I don't like money? You think I don't like you making more money so we can go on better vacations? So we can eventually buy a nicer house? So we can do more things? So we can have a better family plan? So, you know, potentially our future kid can go to a nice private school? He's like, I love the things that money can do for us and our relationship and our family. I don't care who makes it, but we got to make it somehow. Now, the question I have is, you said he's got a very successful job, very demanding. Yes. Yes. So it seems like he's very fulfilled. Yeah. Now, what if he wasn't? What if he lost <sighs> his job and he's lost his job for over two years? Yeah. So not even just like, oh, my God, OK, I can find another job. Like he has gone from loving his life, fulfillment. Yeah. Yes, I support my woman to lost his job, lost his identity and now has to rely on you every single day. Transparently, yeah. I think that would be really hard yeah. for him and for me because, mm. one, I'm incredibly busy right now. And what I love so much is that I never have to feel guilty when I finish my work day at 9 p.m. because he's also wrapping his day around that same time. And then the little 30 minutes or hour we have together, we get to be super present or we get to catch up on like a TV show that's like our show. And he's like, don't watch without me. And I'm like, don't watch without me. And our lifestyle currently is such a perfect mesh. Um, funny enough that you should mention that he is actually uh, in the process right now of changing jobs, um, you know, still staying in finance, but just found a better opportunity. And he is going to be on fun employment you know, have something fun employment. fun employment. It's when you have something lined up, you know, it's, you know, you have the next start date ready to go, but you know, you have a little bit of time off. And I told him, I was like, don't get too comfortable. You can mm -hmm. play golf for like two weeks, but then you got to help me with stuff. And we laugh about it and we joke about it, but I think it's so positive and has such a positive connotation in both of our heads because we both know it's temporary. It's, a mandatory leave he has to take to get this next job um, due to a, you know, a non-compete, very traditional finance thing. If it was actually him losing his job, not him finding a better one, it'd be a certainly different conversation. And I do think that it would be very uncomfortable. And that's a problem I personally find is just that everybody across the world ties their identity to what they do for a living. Mm -hmm. Because when we're at a party and I'm like, oh, hey, Lisa, like, what do you do? I don't even ask you, like, what are your hobbies or tell me about yourself. I say, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And I expect you to lead with that because that should be your entire identity. And we tie so much of our inherent value as a person to our success in our careers, how much money we can make, and a lot of things that, frankly, are not ultimately in our control. And that's kind of scary. Mm. Yeah, God, I really think through this. So when I was hearing about your story, I was like, well, there is that other flip world, right? And I think about me and my husband too. It's like we built our wealth together. We came, you know, both had nothing. I mean, do you, okay, serious question. Yeah, go for it. Do you think if you had built all of your wealth by yourself, you had, you know, done Quest by yourself mm -hmm. and you were single now, do you think it would be really hard for you to date? because you wouldn't know if you, people liked you for you or your money? So I, I really thought about this. I'm like, if my husband dies, like we talk about no, this all the time. Oh, we do, <laughs> we do. I say to him, babe, if, we, if I die, 
I want you to find a woman that's going to take good care of you. Yeah. Like I really want him, I really do want that for him. So we talk about this a lot. And so um, I've really thought about it. Unfortunately, people probably know that I'm wealthy, but I would yeah. probably try and hide it initially. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what I really, and I- Couldn't always, wear those sweatpants. No, couldn't <laughs> wear those sweatpants. No, no, gotta hide the logo. Um, but the reason why I asked you the question was because if I had built the wealth myself yeah. and people didn't know about it, what would I look for in a guy? Because look, I, I'm quite I'm mm. traditional. I was brought, brought up Greek Orthodox. I'm quite traditional on that. I actually do want a guy to go out there and have fulfillment. Yeah. And not fulfillment on a like, I'm just doing an ice cold bath every day and chilling. Yeah. Like, no, 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 no. That's so Los Angeles. That is so LA. <laughs> it's so true. But like, I would want them to have true fulfillment. Yeah. And if I found someone with true fulfillment, I wouldn't care what they did. Yeah. But now I can say it because I can financially support myself mm -hmm. so would I still feel like that if I didn't have any money yeah I don't know so it's a very tricky mm -hmm. kind of navigation and so that's why I love to talk about it and even with your story because you guys met where he was you know earning more and I don't want to say the breadwinner because you were still working but then that evolved over time and so how do people if I'm thinking about a woman who's now at home who wants to now start making money wants to start really you know like come in maybe into the workforce or speak to her partner about the equity, not equality, mm -hmm. how do they navigate A, the conversation, and then B, what do they do when they find themselves that evolution? So I went, I don't know if you know, I went from a stay-at-home wife for eight years mm -hmm. to then starting Quest with my husband. Mm -hmm. So I wanted four children, found myself, found business, was like, I love this shit, let me, like, let me, like, I freaking, like, feel like a badass. Like, I didn't know something yesterday, and today I know it. Yeah. Who knew? You know, like, <laughs> it was, like, so empowering to me. And so, but in deciding not to have children and that evolution, it was very hard. Yeah. And it was risky that me and my husband were going to make it through. And it was the communication. It was the mm -hmm. endless talking about if this, then that. So I think about your story and I think about how you guys navigated it and that you guys are in this beautiful place. But what if it all got ripped away? What does it look like? So yeah. it's, there's a lot of complexity to that. Um, when I think about people looking at the types of relationships we can have, the financial independence that we can have. We compare ourselves to people. So whether it's yeah. your friend who compared her leaving the cockroach, uh, cockroach <laughs> apartment and moves in with this guy and she looks at you and that comparison, that can sometimes, I think, lead us to making poor decisions, yeah. whether it's poor decisions in a relationship or just regular poor uh, financial decisions. Yeah. So how do you think through that? How do, have you ever had that comparison trap? And if so, how did you make sure, or maybe you didn't and you did make uh, financial errors, but how do you make sure you don't keep repeating them to then lead to a goal that you actually don't want? Yeah, so this was a very interesting thing. I grew up in, you know, a I would say like middle class, upper middle class neighborhood, but my parents were the ones who bought the smallest home in the best school district. Um, so we certainly didn't have a lot left over, but my parents made it a huge decision to invest a bunch of their money, save a bunch of their money to help me pay for school. And through a series of merit scholarships from the actual college I went to, my parents' help and outside private scholarships that I just applied to and was able to receive and qualify for, I graduated college with zero student loans. And I went to the University of Chicago, which is a very elite top tier mm -hmm. college in the US. And when I got there, I saw a level of wealth I had never seen before. Like, it was a big deal in my high school if someone had the classic Louis Vuitton tote bag. And now suddenly I'm looking around college and people are toting around Goyards. I mean, there were exchange students toting around Birkin bags. And so I'm like, wait. Mm. I, I didn't even know these brands existed, much less potentially even had access to them. Um, and it very much started to feel like a series of keeping up with the Joneses. Um, I was buying stuff that I certainly didn't need with money I didn't have to impress people I didn't like and were never going to like me. And mm -hmm. this continued probably until the Roach situation, because at that point I had to have a real like come to Jesus moment to be like, hey, you gotta tighten the belt. You cannot be spending your money like this. And I joke about this, I call it the Instagramification of society. 
every single summer, every single person I've ever met in my entire life goes to Mykonos. I'm like, <laughs> how do you all afford to like literally stay here all summer? Cause I'm at my computer working. Everybody in the summer goes and skis in Aspen and Vale. I'm like, I know what ski, like I know what lift fees are. I know what the season pass for the icon pass cost. Like, how can you guys afford this? And I say that as someone who makes a very, very healthy living. And not to mention the designer clothes, the bags, the vacations. A new thing that a lot of people I know now are doing recently has been chartering full private jets Mm. for them and their friends. And yes, they're splitting it amongst like 20 of these guys that they all know each other. But like, I'm like, I've never ridden on a private jet. Like, that would be kind of cool. And that's not even something that I want in my life. Like I, I am, you know, I get nervous during turbulence. Why am I trying to get on a smaller <laughs> plane? Like that doesn't make any sense. So like, I feel like sometimes seeing so much stuff in your face constantly 24 seven makes you think you want things that you don't actually like care about. Cause in any other reality, I would never be like, Oh, I should go fly private. Like I need to be on as big of a commercial carrier as possible right in the middle. So I'd feel nothing. And it's just really interesting because never before in society, have we ever had such an in-depth look into people's personal lives? And frankly, I don't think we should like how much money some of these ultra wealthy billionaires have is none of my business. I do not need to be exposed to some of the things that they're doing because we, our money is not the same. I do not need to be getting red light therapy on my face every single day. Like that costs a crazy amount of money. And for average people to be exposed to that and suddenly think I need that. I need that in my life to be happy. Those are all discretionary expenses. And it puts them in a financial position where they then can't necessarily afford to pay for some of those bare necessities that that money otherwise should have been allocated to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, a great example of how I think, I'm going to generalize and say a lot of women, but obviously it's people, um, a lot of women end up m- uh, making decisions that actually aren't right for them financially, whether it's within their relationship or solo, that then leads to, I'm going to say disaster. So growing up, I would see, I had um, a few wealthy friends and I remember, I remember them buying things that they couldn't necessarily afford because their friends had it. And then they would hide the purchase from their husbands. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So now I'm like, not only are you stretching yourself thin because you want to feel a certain way about yourself because someone else that you know has it, but now you're bringing that into your home and you're hiding it from the one person. That's financial infidelity. Mm -hmm. Financial infidelity. Infidelity can be the actual physical act of cheating, Mm -hmm. but also when you are lying to your partner, like that can't feel good. When you have to hide things from your partner, that can't feel good. Like some, like, you know, they've, they've done research on this. Like many people actually consider emotional cheating to be worse than physical cheating and financial cheating is in my mind, one of the worst, because it doesn't just impact one person. It impacts both of you. That's your joint money. That is something that you have built together and you've agreed, like, we are going to do this and we are going to build towards this. And imagine you just have all these little side quests detracting from the big goal. Mm. God, I've never heard of financial infidelity. That's so true. I never thought of it like that. So what do you think? I mean, obviously, advice number one, don't do it. Yeah, don't. But um, (laughs) what do you think is happening then? Like, what is that that people feel like they have to hide it? Is it the shame, do you think? That they got (sighs) trapped into buying something that they know they can't afford because they want to feel a certain way that their friend made them feel? It's essentially like wanting to have your cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. Um, you want to maintain the appearance of being like a responsible partner to your partner, but you want to show that you have more than you likely do to other people around you. Um, And frankly, I think that comes from like a place of deep insecurity. The secret bank account, the secret credit card is a lot more common than people are willing to admit. There were even people on Wall Street when, you know, I was dating, you know, I was the one of the young single people on the desk. Somebody was like, you should always have a secret bank account. And I was like, excuse me, like why? And he, and this person told me, they were like, 
you always got to like make sure you have something set aside for a rainy day. And I'm like, that's cool. Like I can have my own bank account with my own money. I don't think I need to hide it from my partner. Mm -hmm. It should just be known that I have my own money and that's okay. And so I just think we need to come to terms with that being really honest and having that conversation, even if it's uncomfortable of Mm -hmm. wanting to have your own thing. Yeah, the hiding of it, I think, is... The the the, issue. The issue, yeah. It's like the second you're trying to hide something, it means that you're not secure about what you're doing. And then the deception of it, to your point, is when if you deceive me in one area... I don't trust you in any of I know. It's like, how am I going to trust you not to go out and cheat? How am I going to trust you to not go and do something behind my back if you're willing to go... Because opening a bank account isn't easy. It's not like you can just... right click an on button. Yeah. It's like you actually have to apply. Like you have to fill out the paperwork. Yeah. You got to go. Yeah. It's very conscious. And what's interesting is I've also heard, though, some uh, women that I have met have had to create a secret bank account in yeah. order to get to feel safe enough to leave a relationship because their Certainly. partner has all the financial uh, um, control. Yeah. And the, let's say they've got kids, they've got a mortgage, they want to leave, but they have zero so there's like these companies now that actually help you if you're in a domestic violent uh, relationship. Yeah. They help you set up all these other things, which I think is amazing. But the, the idea to do it so that you can cheat like, <laughs> is just deceiving. Dece- One version of this gives me the massive ick and the other is very hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It's yeah. actually a really good way of putting it. Um, the, the, com- the comparison thing is really important for me to talk about because I do think that Again, I'm going to go back to what are the traps that we find ourselves that we get in and then we make decisions that don't serve us. And one thing you talk about in your book that I'd love to debate with you actually a bit. let's do it. Is you talk about you can't save yourself to wealth. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mind explaining, then I'll talk about why I uh, like my basically my rebuttal and I'd love to talk through it. So I will say there is an exception to this. If you are an exceptionally high earner, you can save your way to wealth. That said, for the vast majority of people, it is no longer possible to save your way to rich. Reason being, you are likely not making enough, and frankly, to outrun inflation. Um, so essentially, you know, if you're making a normal salary, you have expenses, you are only setting aside, you know, 10, 15, 20% of your income, that money can't just all sit in a savings account because that savings account is paying you pennies in interest. Whereas if you invest, if you invest in a diversified portfolio that tracks, you know, the S&P 500 or just a couple broader indices, you can likely earn somewhere between eight to 10% annually. Mm -hmm. And that is going to help your money essentially keep up over time as life gets more and more expensive. Because we already know what eggs cost today, but what about what are eggs going to cost in 50 years? They're going to be more expensive, almost guaranteed. And so when you're saving, your money is essentially being eaten away at. And you can't get to the point where you are ever going to be able to keep up with what your life will cost if you aren't investing. Okay, I actually completely agree with you. <laughs> like you convinced me. Um, the thing that there's, it's not actually, I didn't disagree. It's more than the nuance of it. Yeah. Because then, because I really hear you and I think that that's super important. I was brought up in a, um, in a generation where it's like, you save yourself, you save every penny. Yeah. It's like, you don't spend it on frivolous things. But we were also brought up in the stuff it under the mattress generation. Yes. Yeah. Oh, actually stuffed it under the mattress. Physical stuffing. Yeah. Yes. Oh, God, my, I mean, it's heartbreaking, but when my grandmother passed away, oh yeah, we looked under a mattress and she, she had her, her money under there. Because we were taught that, save every penny. You know, my dad was born in a tiny uh, village in the mountains of Cyprus. So his toilet was a hole in the floor. Right. So that's one generation, my dad. So teaching me, save every penny, don't spend it frivolously, only on the things that you actually need, finish your plate, all of those, you know, don't leave any food, you know, uh, uneaten. Mm -hmm. So then my husband comes to me, so flash forward, 10, 15 years later, my husband comes to me and he's got a crazy idea that he wants to start a protein bar company. Now, in order to start the protein bar company, it meant that we had to save every penny because we were going to take his salary from six figures and literally split it in half. Mm -hmm. And so... I had to sit down and go, instead of doing taking that Starbucks, I'm going to make my own coffee. Instead of doing mm-hmm. this, I'm going to do that. So I started saving. Now kind of bringing everything together with a comparison thing. The thing that was the hardest for me was all my homegirls were going to Starbucks, mm-hmm. hanging out and having coffee. And I had to make the decision 
the comparison thing of I'm saving up. I'm yeah. saving up for this company that we're trying to put our money towards because we've just taken a massive cut. I have to pay my mortgage. Yeah. And so I made all these trimmings. And what I ended up doing, I had to really look at my ego, girl. I had to really look at my ego because I was like, I felt badly about myself that all my girls were going out and I either had to say no um, and not be a part of it. And then I had FOMO. So I started to process, okay, do you actually have to say no, Lisa? Mm -hmm. What would it look like if you took your own coffee? What would it look like if I was honest with my friends about the fact that we're trying something, we're gonna experiment, and right now I just don't have the finances to buy a Starbucks coffee. But you know what? I'm still gonna come and hang out with you. I'm gonna bring my own coffee. Yeah. And so that's where I ended up. And that allowed me to build the business that ended up being a billion dollar business. Yes. So there's the thing where people are like, I'm not gonna save anything, I, I deserve, and this isn't what you were saying actually, but there are people that say, I deserve an avocado and toast, I know that that's yeah. the example that you use these days in LA. I deserve this, and so I'm gonna have it. Versus making a decision for the short term that actually isn't gonna serve you in the long term. Yeah. Based on wanting to feel like part of the group and not wanting to feel the odd one out with your friends. Yeah, 100%. I think we get corralled, and again, we are you know, the product of the five people that are closest around us, and if all of your friends are spending their money in a way that isn't necessarily serving them, we're going to do the same thing, mm -hmm. right? Like, I think coffee and avocado toast has been demonized in our society. And we hear things like avocado toast is the reason why millennials can't buy homes. Mm -hmm. Okay. But like, if you had avocado toast once a weekend, like it ain't that much money. It's certainly not enough to put a down payment down, especially not in LA, but it is two grand. And two grand can do a lot of things for you that some avocado on some bread cannot. Mm -hmm. And so I always just like to think about things as a cost benefit analysis. So in your case, the cost would be that time with your friends, but you found a way that you didn't have to give up that and could still participate while, you know, just inconveniencing yourself for the three minutes it took to make your own coffee. Mm -hmm. It was more the ego thing. Yes, because you wanted to have the cup. You want, you want the Starbucks cup. You want yes. the cup, you want the green straw. Mm -hmm. I get it. But how many of your girlfriends can say they have sold a billion dollar company? Yeah. Yeah, it's nobody. It's you. Because you were willing to do something that other people were not so that you can now have something that other people can't. Mm. Whew, that was really good. <laughs> um, what do you think the misconceptions are around money that have held women back for so long for talking about it? Because before we started rolling, I'm going to be honest to my audience, before we started rolling, I even said to you, I was like, I don't talk about money much. Yeah. I'm still shy, embarrassed. I'm not shameful at all. I wear expensive clothes, but I also wear cheap things like my Wonder Woman necklace. So I don't value money, but I see it as such a necessity and an importance to be able to facilitate your dreams. But it's still a stigma. Why do you think it's still a stigma? And what are the misconceptions around it? Well, I also think it has a lot to do with heritage and how you grew up. And, you know, you talked about being Cypriot and it, your dad growing up with a hole in the ground for a toilet. Even though that's not your story, I guarantee when you were a kid, your dad made some comment that my parents also made. I walked uphill both ways to school <laughs> yeah, and yes. I didn't even have shoes. And, say, in the cold, barefoot. Yeah, no shoes. Like, <laughs> uh, we didn't even have lunch. I just, you know, breathed some air and I was grateful to be able to go to school. Okay, we get it. We get it. But you have internalized that. That's why mm -hmm. you still finish all the food on your plate. That's why you still do all of those things. And it's the same scar tissue as to why... I now a multimillionaire at, you know, in my twenties, when I buy something, you best believe I'm doing six hours of research. I'm picking the right credit card to get the right number of points. I'm using a cashback affiliate site. I'm then making sure that I have the best deal. I will sign up for the email to get an extra 10% off. I am just so crazy about making sure I get the best deal because that's how I was raised to shop. That's how I was raised to spend my dollar. Like it was the last one I was ever gonna get. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our money habits are instilled in us before we turn age seven. Is it really seven? seven. Wow. It's also when your brain basically like turns from a sponge into a rock and it's much harder to learn languages. Mm -hmm. 
So even though now you are in a very amazing financial position, you are very comfortable, you've built a big empire, you know, you have everything that you could possibly need. There is a tiny piece of you that is always going to be the daughter of the guy who walked uphill both way to school. Mm. And I think that speaks volumes because even if we make it, it won't be until the next generation or, you know, however you choose to give your money upon your passing, like that will truly benefit. We're always going to have that. It's in our DNA. Mm. And when we want to push back against that, it's going to be uncomfortable. Um, I am probably my parents' nightmare in terms of career because they are very much put your head down, nose to grindstone, work hard. We are immigrants. People will recognize you if you do well. I, however, learned on Wall Street that when you do something, it's not enough to just do it. You have to tell people you're doing it. You got to do it. Then you got to march around and be like, hello, look at the amazing thing I did. Like, look at how smart I am. And, you know, pat yourself on the back and basically just go around being your own advocate because it's not the person who's the smartest who gets paid. It's the person who's the loudest. And so I now in my career am so brutally transparent. I literally broke down what I made every single year in my career from 2012 to 2023. And people were like, wow, thank you so much for this transparency. Very few people would ever have the gall to tell people this. Mm -hmm. And it's not an embarrassment, but it's almost this sense of like taboo because we have been told our entire lives, especially as women, that talking about money is rude. It's tacky. It's taboo. And it's not. Because when you go to exclusive places that you can't get into unless you got that generational, generational money, your grandfather helped found the country mm-hmm. club, whatever, you see guys teeing off, smoking a cigar, drinking a beer at 8 a.m. and talking about their investment portfolios, talking about what their compensation packages are. I mean, I watched it happen. My fiance literally called up all of his guy friends to then see, get information from folks to negotiate his own compensation package. And I was like, wow, that's so awesome that you have people you can call and ask that question to. Because for a long time, I didn't have anybody I could ask that question to. And no one would tell me. And it wasn't until I started asking my girlfriends and I was like, just tell me, how much do you make? Uh, That they were like, you know, this is awkward. Please don't make fun of me. You probably make more than me. And I'm like, why would I make fun of you? You literally were my best friend in college holding my hair as I was throwing up in an alley. Like, what is there to make fun of? You see me in my (laughs) darkest, deepest state. Isn't that weird, though, that you can be thrown up in an alley, like, you know, totally hungover, totally drunk, whatever. And yet the embarrassment is Is how much we make. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So... Being transparent has allowed other people to be transparent. Has that then given more women more confidence? Because I really do think it's A, the belief system that we've had, but also the confidence piece of like, what if I get judged? What if someone thinks less of me? And so staying quiet is just like, well, now my work will just show for itself. It's a two-part thing because you're worried if you have less than, people will look down on you. And then if you have more than, it'll become a thing where there's inherent jealousy And people will not like you for that. You can't win unless you're exactly right in the middle. And that's what we need to reprogram our brains to think. Because if you have less than and you find out your friend makes more than, my immediate follow-up question is, how can I also have that? Mm -hmm. But if you have more than, your immediate follow-up question is, what can I do to help you make as much as I'm making? And instead of feeling like we need to be all equal, I hate that word, Mm -hmm. equal, it sucks, I want us to feel a level of comfort that we can continue to level up. So we don't have to be less than or more than. It'll be a constant flux of each of us essentially being the next peg on the climbing wall that you can grasp onto. You are able to level up yourself by helping your crew level up. I love that. And do you think that's the difference then between men and women, whereas women want to be pleasers, they want to fit in the group, like think about tribes back in the day. It's like in a village, 
You wanted everyone to get along because that was safety. Yes, but also more of a modern take mm-hmm. is that men know that there are spots for all of them. And women, we often feel like we're fighting to be the token. Oh. So I'll be, I'll be honest, so honest with you. In my early 20s, I looked at every woman around me on the trading floor as my competition. Yes. Because I was like, it's you or me, baby. It's mm. you or me. Because there's like one spot. There's, one, oh, there's always shit. the one girl. Yeah. Um. I was so lucky because my manager was the only other woman and she was nearly 20 years my senior. So we were obviously not in competition with each other. She took me under her wing as like my protege. But had she been two years older than me, without a doubt, she would have seen me as competition and I would have felt the same way. Mm. Because when you're 24 and you are fighting for your life to be in this competitive seat, you see everybody that kind of even looks like you or smells like you as competition. And what I've learned now at my big old age of 29, you know, almost entering 30, like you get so much more out of life from collaborating with other women than competing with them. Because the crazy things that women have done for me have helped me just entirely change my life. I mean, when I was at my media and tech job, I was the youngest person on the team and, you know, probably one of the least tenured and a new, I, I had a coworker that I was really close with and I just turned to her one day and I'm like, I'm about to go ask for more money. What do you make? And at first she hesitated and she's like, well, don't tell anyone I told you. And I was like, obviously not. I'm not going to say you told me. But then I asked for more than what she was making. I didn't get it, but I got what she was making. Mm. And I'm like, you know what? Good enough for me. She's a lot more senior than me. She's a lot better at this job than I am. And then I told her, I was like, just so you know, I got what you're making. So you need to ask for more. And she leveled up too. I love that. And now both of us are making 10 grand more than we were making, you know, two weeks ago. Mm. I feel good. She feels good. That's collaboration. There's an extra 20 grand just between the two of us. Mm. And that is something that I feel like men do a lot better than women. And all of us need to work on is collaborating and helping each other to do this versus trying to push each other down. Mm. And when you went into, that's an amazing story, by the way. Mm -hmm. And when you went in to ask for that pay raise, how much of it were you aware that you were a woman asking for a pay raise? Luckily for me, in this media and tech job, the sales team was majority women. Mm. So I didn't feel any type of way being a woman asking for that. When I worked on Wall Street, I was the only woman junior. And there, it did feel like oftentimes that when I would ask, not even just for money, but for anything, I was asking for it as the girl. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was one guy who was just so rude. He was like, oh yeah, the girl. Yeah. You were literally just called the girl. The girl. When I was an intern, uh, it was two guys and me, and we were, it was three of us. We were all vying for one seat. And by the way, I got the seat. I was called the girl intern. <sighs> As if that was my only differentiating factor. Right. Girl intern. So how did you respond back then to things like that? I took it on the chin. What would you do now? I think if I was still in that same position, I was an intern, I would react the exact same way. I wasn't in a position of power to speak up, to do anything. Now, if I was in my position now, like it's, you know, your rich BFF Mm -hmm. as a New York Times bestselling author, you know, as this big digital creator who's built a business, I would never let anybody talk to me like that. Girl intern, girl, are you joking? I'd be like, I have accomplished more in the past three years of my life than you have in a lifetime. And you will not speak to me like that. And I treat my team the same way. When we work with other businesses, we work with vendors, we go to venues, we things like that. I tell everyone, I'm like, everybody better speak to my team, my assistant, everyone, as if they are a proxy of me and it better be with respect. They better not have any attitude. I don't care that my team is all women. I don't care that they may not necessarily look the part. You don't have to be a sunglass wearing tour manager. You can be a young woman and that's okay. 
you're going to treat my team with respect because we're bringing our A game and it's going to rock your world. And if you're, if you behave and you play nice, we're all going to make a lot of money. Hell yeah. I love that answer. And that's so powerful. That comes from a position of power. Yes. Of having already 1000%. the money, the New York Times, yes. The, yes. the name brand and everything. Yes. And so if your personality was now having learned everything and you were still an intern, you wouldn't speak up because you knew that that would, you would just get fired. Like what's, yeah. what's, yeah, this is where I get tripped I up because here's the thing. I don't want to pretend and I really love that you're freaking honest. It's, it's important that we talk honesty here. You got to read the room. Dude, I, I think I may be <laughs> the same. Like, oh, so would I? I'm like trying to think through. I think you are who you are and it's probably who you've always been. Even back then, I knew it was wrong. Mm. Even back then, it pissed me off. But I knew that I would get more out of the situation by proving to them the girl intern was the smart intern than by making a big fuss about the fact that they referred to me as the girl intern. Mm. Because I knew by the end of that 10 weeks, I wasn't going to be the girl intern. I was going to be the analyst they hired. <laughs> and guess what I was? The other two boys got booted off the desk. Fuck yeah. So I think it is about reading the room. It's a lot easier for, you know, you and myself in positions where we're, you know, our own bosses, positions of power, positions of financial stability mm -hmm. to walk around saying it's easy to stand up for yourself. It's not. It is hard. It is one of the hardest things on earth. But there are moments where you are going to realize that standing up for yourself is going to propel your career further forward than taking it. Mm. And then there are other times where you kind of just kind of got to take it on the chin and tell yourself like this person is ignorant, they're stupid, they're not as talented as me, but you know what? They're older, they've got a higher job title. Sometimes you just got to suck it up. What you doing, shopping for a new outfit? Yeah, I found all of these amazing stores online that I've never heard of before. Homie, you crazy? The internet is full of freaking threats. And if you let even your guard down for one second, it could be the end where you actually get freaking scammed. No, not really at all. I don't have to be afraid of scammers anymore thanks to Aura. What's Aura? Aura's powerful tools are designed to keep you safe from all types of cyber threats, from identity theft monitoring to real-time fraud prevention. Aura has everything you need to stay one step ahead. And I've got to go collect my badass top that just arrived in the mail, thank you. And you may need to think about some wearing something too. Aura, what's wrong with the outfit? That's so powerful because I do think you're absolutely right. Like I want to, I wish the world wasn't that way, no. but it is. So now knowing the way the world is, how do you show up? How do you interact with people? And I like the idea of A, read the room and then just like to your point, like what is the goal? So for you, it's like, I, I plan to be the analyst. So they can call me the girl internal they like. I'm going to show them. That's super freaking powerful. And then there's also power in standing up for yourself. So knowing when to do it, when not to reach that goal, I think is beautiful. And you do it so well. And when I was young, I was like, the amount of, the amount of stories that I could go back to, like, I was disrespected and someone talked down on me. I'm five foot one, so I get patted <laughs> on the head a lot. Like, I've, the amount of dudes that have patted on me on the head growing up. Ugh. Yes. Um, and I didn't have the confidence to speak up. Then as I started to get into my teens and my early 20s, I started to realize like, oh, hey, you really have to, you know, in order, because I wanted to be in Hollywood. So I was like, in order to make it in Hollywood, you got to have a strong backbone because you can't get stepped on. But it depends how and where, like read the room. Mm -hmm. And so I've had many moments where I was disrespected on set, on a movie set. And then there was one time that they just crossed the line. And I was like, and now after that moment, I felt good about myself mm -hmm. because I had a line and I was like, okay, this I'm willing to accept. It's not, I'm not saying it's right yep. to your point. I'm not saying that it should be. I'm smart be. enough to know that it's not relevant. Per, love that. Absolute perfect way of saying it. But then there is a line where I'm yeah. like, now you are crossing my values, my morals, my self-esteem, and I just will not let it. And it yeah. was, and I was an, um, it's a version of an intern. So it was a production assistant, which basically you get all the jobs. It's yeah. like you have to run around <laughs> doing all the crap. So I'm the one running around doing all the crap. And one of the, um, the wardrobe assistant at the time was off sick. So she asked me to step in. So she gives me this box and she's like, all right, there's a scene. Everything you need is in this box. So I was like, all right, great. 
So we're doing the scene, the actor's lighting these matches, lights it, and then he runs out. So he turns around, he's like, where's the next matchbox? And I'm like scrambling, looking in the box, and I can't find it. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. And he throws the matchbox at me in front of everybody, the entire crew. I'm 23. And on set, in front of everybody, he just throws the matchbox at me. I'm very insecure at this point, very insecure. But he just crossed the line. And I just stood up and I took the matchbox and I said, please do not disrespect me. I, will f I am stepping in to help someone else. I will find it, give me five minutes. And I go fucking running. And like, I just run around, he's got a freaking match, right? Like, and then I come back to set and I handed it back to him. That was the first moment of my life that I remember that no matter what, there is a line that someone just doesn't get to demean you. Yeah. But also to your point, it doesn't mean that you have to do that all the time. It doesn't mean that the second someone shows a sign of disrespect, that you should come like a bull in a china shop because it may not serve you. But that story always stuck in my mind. Did, did they ever apologize? So what was super interesting is he didn't apologize, but he was the nicest human to me after that. Mm. Every time I was on set, he's like, Lisa, and he was famous. So all these girls are like swooning. I had no idea who he was coming from England. So I was like, I have no idea who this dude is. <laughs> and all the women were swooning. The second I did that, literally everyone's like holding their breath. They're like, is the director going to fire you? Because you don't disrespect. They feel I disrespected by standing yeah. up for myself. Um, and so, but no, he was the nicest human after that. He treated me with the most respect of anyone on that set. And that was a powerful lesson. Because you knew lesson. you were going to take it. Yeah. But I do think, you know, to your question, like, what's next? I think the whole point of being smart enough to know better, to work your way up, to get into a position of power, is so that women who look like you and me can then look down the corporate ladder, and when new analysts or associates or young people who want to do what you do look up, they can see a face that looks like yours or mine. Mm -hmm. Because... I will say the biggest saving grace, even though the first few years of my being on Wall Street were, you know, not easy, I always had my mentor and she looked like me. And it was so powerful to see a rich Asian woman who would come in every day with a designer bag and I'd gone to her apartment. It was the nicest apartment I'd seen in all of New York. She had a dog. And do you have any idea how expensive it is to have a dog in New York City? <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, like this is amazing. This is gonna be my life. I'm gonna be so rich. But to have somebody who had done it, it made it feel like it was more attainable for me. Mm. And so when we stand up for ourselves, but when we are in positions of power, ultimately the hope is that we don't treat people with that type of disrespect. We continue to respect them. We continue to foster them and it makes it so much easier for young women, for young people of color to step into those roles and see themselves in a lived reality where someone who looks like them has already succeeded. Mm. What do you think it was then that allowed your mentor to be able to lean in, especially back then as a female Asian, where you're basically being told stay quiet. How, what do you think it was that allowed her to have the confidence to own it and because I, I assume that leaked onto you and that's why you have so much of the yeah. confidence. Yeah, so I asked, I was like, did you have a you? Right. And she didn't. But she told me, she was like, no, I made a lot of mistakes. She was like, I wasn't good at saving my money. I bought a ton of clothes that I don't have any idea where they went. I, you know, was pretty frivolous. I got my dog way too early on. I certainly could not afford to give that dog the life it deserved. And she made sure I didn't fall into any of those pitfalls, even though it would not benefit her in any way, only to see me do better than she could. And what does that say about how much she loved me and how much she saw me in her, that she wanted me to not have to go through all of that hardship? Mm -hmm. And she also, you know, was very candid with me. She was like, listen, like, I've worked this career for quite a long time. These are the things that are great. These are the things that are bad. You have to know that going in. And she told me, you know, before we went out for a couple of our first client events, she was like, she's like, I don't care what time you go home. Then tomorrow when people ask you when you got, when you left or when you went home, you went home at 1130. I'm like, wait, why am I lying about when I went home? 
And she said to me, she was like, as the only woman on the desk, the young woman on the desk, you have to be twice as good to get half as much. You have to be beyond reproach. You cannot give anyone a reason to think that you messed up a trade, that you fumbled a client's order, that you even messed up the lunch run. Do not give people a reason to doubt you ever. She was like, I don't care if you have to go into the bathroom, puke, suck down a Gatorade, and then come back to work, put a smile on your face, put a, you know, a top knot on your head so tight you get a free face lift. Like she was like, <laughs> you will look fresh and rested and you will not look like you were out partying until 2 a.m. I was like, okay. So when I went out to client events, whether or not I went home at nine or whether I went home at four, I told everybody I left at before midnight. It's like Cinderella. You had to leave before midnight so you could get an adequate amount of rest before the next day of work. Wow. What other piece of advice did she give you? This is fascinating. Oh, I mean, don't get Botox off of Groupon. You know, uh, <laughs> she, she, she also gave me some really wonderful advice that I take into my career too, is just yeah, be a funny. high value human what and does that know mean? your value. Um, so in my early 20s, like many other young early 20 somethings, I was dating. And when you're dating, you know, there are certain people who are more respectful of you and who you are and actually want to get to know you and other people that are like, hey, are you up at 3 a.m.? Mm -hmm. And I told her this and she was like, don't you dare ever text anybody back after midnight. She's like, nothing good happens after midnight. You make sure that you are high value. If someone wants to get to know you, they can do so within the working day hours mm -hmm. of the light. And it reminded me that like, even in my career, like, I'm not somebody's backup option. I don't have to jump in to do this last minute thing and completely inconvenience my schedule just because it's a good opportunity because somebody else fell through. No, what is for me is for me. You will come to me months in advance, book me out, be ready, and then we'll do it. How did you know your worth back then? Because I think that so many people in that moment we we'll be like, yeah, 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 whatever I can do. Um, and so you end up, it becomes that dripping effect. You just slowly, you lower the bar just a bit. Mm -hmm. You lower the bar just a bit. Mm -hmm. How did you not get trapped there? Or did you? There were times I did, certainly. Um, but she was constantly reminding me. She was like, you know, you may have messed up today, but you're good. You know how to think the way that we're supposed to be thinking. You're talented. Don't forget that. And... Oh man, there was one, I think I was like a year and a half in, my manager, this woman, was on her mandatory block leave. So she was on her two week vacation and a big headline came out about one of the stocks she traded. And the guy who was, you know, the other senior trader who I worked for was sitting next to me and it came in and I was the first person to see the headline because it was like a slow summer day. And this was good news for her or bad news for her? Good because it meant that a ton of trading volume was about to happen Got in it. a stock that wouldn't necessarily trade so often. And I caught the headline. I announced it over the loudspeaker. I traded like 80% of the volume that afternoon across the entire street. Wow. Me, this you know, moron 23, 24 year old. I was the go-to person. The sales guys who were all 20 years my senior were calling me, asking me what I was seeing, what I was planning on doing, where I was trying to, you know, stick and move. And man, I have never felt a high like that. Mm -hmm. the, the research guy called down from the research desk to be like, where is, you know, your manager? I'm like, she's on vacation. I'm trading it. What do you want to know? It's <laughs> amazing. And I called her that day when I left work and I was like, that was the greatest day of my life. Mm. And she was like, I am so proud of you. I'm so proud of everything you were able to do while I was gone and like take all of these things that you had practiced while I was there that, you know, maybe she wouldn't have had the confidence to let me like push into the deep end. But when it counted, you know, the little bird flew mm -hmm. and it felt really good to know that I was smart enough to do it. Like all of these people who, were like legitimate employees, not me, just the analyst, the baby. They were calling me, asking me what I, my plan was. They were like, what's your plan? I was like, my plan? I didn't even have a plan. I'm just trying to figure out what's going on right now. But I came up with a plan. I knew what I was doing. I was making her a ton of money that day. And 
it was amazing. One of my favorite quotes is actually um, from Steve Martin, the comedian. Mm. Be so good they can't ignore you. Yes. And it seems like in that moment, homie, you were just so good that you just couldn't be couldn't ignored. Couldn't ignore me. Yep. And every time I find any type of situation where I'm people are judging me or trying to hold me back because I'm female, because I'm filling the blank, I always just remind myself, be so good, it just can't be ignored. And I don't often fight the righteousness of it, you know, because I want to. Yeah. In turn, and I'm like, See, just because I'm a woman. Yeah. But I'm like, sometimes it doesn't serve me. Sometimes I just need to be so damn good that I can't be ignored. And now it's not that I'm the best female, it's that I'm the best person for the job. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for a while they were like, oh, five great women personal finance creators to follow. Mm. Now they're just saying top finance professionals yeah. online. And I'm top of that list. I mean, I made best personal finance creator by Bankrate this past year. Best. Not woman, not any sort of stipulation. Best. And I think that really speaks volumes of what you just mentioned mm. of being so good you can't mm. be ignored. I'm not just the best of blank. I am the best. Yeah, fuck yeah. Um, you said earlier that um, to be, you really want to be like the high value woman. Yeah. What else to you does that mean? And then how are you making sure that you stay a high value woman? High value women know exactly what they're worth and they're willing to walk away when they are not given it. I think for so many of us, one of the scariest things to do is asking for a raise at work. And we're happy with that piddly dink two to 3% every single year. It's like, oh, that's the inflation raise. Like, great, what am I supposed to do with this? Mm -hmm. I have just kept up, if not even, right now inflation's 5%, last year was nine. Two to 3% is getting me nothing. And high value women know that they are going to do their best to ask for more money at work. But they also know that if they're not getting it here, they're gonna get it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. They know when it is time to go, when it is time to stay, like know when to hold them, know when to fold them, mm. but you have to know what is going to serve you. And ultimately you have to recognize that your company is selfish. If it at any point did not make sense to keep you around any longer, they would fire you, you're done, bye, you're laid off. Why are we considering a company when asking for more money? That money's coming out of a corporate banking account. like set aside to pay labor staff. I don't feel bad asking for more money. I deserve it. Fuck yeah. <laughs> and so how do you go in then and then pitch that? Because as a boss who's had many employees, at Quest we had 3,000 employees, um, I've led many teams and the one thing that I see often is people come and ask for a raise, but they have zero to back it up. They have, um, zero proof that they, I want to say like deserve quote unquote. So I'm always like, well, well show me, like I, wa I want yeah. to be convinced. I want to give you more money because I want you to stay. Convince me. But some people don't know how to convince. They just go in with a handout and they don't know why to your point or what you were saying of like, no, I, you know, I'm this, I deserve this and this is what I want. People don't then necessarily follow up with the why. Yeah. How do we follow up with the why? How do we actually, how do you believe in yourself to go in and say, this is what I deserve? You come with the receipts. You mentioned it, right? You want to have a why. And I think the easiest thing to do is to create a brag book in your inbox. And I love this because also this is like my, if I'm like, I'm about to quit this job. I hate this job so much. I, everything is bad. I'm bad at my job. I'm stupid. I go through this folder and it also is a pick me up. So anytime something good happens to you and it gets emailed into your inbox, someone congratulates you or says, wow, couldn't have done it without you, da, 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 da. Mm. Forward that email to a separate folder called your brag book and then the year. And then when it is time for mid-year review or end of year review, you literally have a laundry list of all of the things you've accomplished and quantifiable numbers of I increased revenue by X. I built the social media following by this many more followers. I wrote this many blogs. I did this numbers, facts, and figures that cannot be debated. Mm -hmm. And then you show your boss. Remember when we set goals at the beginning of the year? I knocked all of them out of the park. I went above and beyond. I'm managing up. I'm doing all of these things. Pay me. Don't say pay me. Say, <laughs> say a, a raise of yeah. XYZ would be commensurate with the amount of production that I've done this year. Mm. 
And do you think that that having those facts and stats allows you to be more confident in going in because you know it's not an emotional thing? I feel like I should versus this is why I should. Yes, 1000%. Because it's essentially going into a test with a crib sheet. You literally Mm -hmm. actually have all the answers of why you deserve it. Whereas an emotional thing, like you don't have anything to truly back it up. So you're arguing around in a circle. You and the person sitting next to you can both say, I'm the hardest working member of the team. Okay, prove it. Which one of you built built more? Which one of you did more? And when you have the numbers, the numbers don't lie. Yeah, I love that so much. Um, So for anyone listening right now, you're very tactical. Your content is so freaking tactical. Your book is amazing. It's so tactical. And so I, the one thing though that really struck me was you said, which really surprising actually, that you said um, the one thing women need to do in order to get finance, I put the word woman in, but um, is they have to strip. Yes. <laughs> so that surprised me that you told me that women have to strip. Do mm-hmm. you mind explaining that? Yes. Okay. So strip is an acronym and it is amazing because no one ever forgets it because they're like, we need a what? Um, <laughs> but strip is an acronym and S stands for savings. I highly recommend everybody have savings, an emergency fund. If you are a singleton, three to six months of living expenses. If you are head of household, have inconsistent income, or somebody depends on you, six to 12 months of living expenses is probably a better bet. Um, Put it into a high yield savings account so you can earn more interest than a traditional brick and mortar bank. Then we move into T, stands for total debt. And total debt, you essentially rank your debt from highest to lowest interest rate. For all my math geeks out there, What essentially this does is it puts all of your scariest and growiest debt at the top and your most, you know, uh, innocuous debt at the bottom. Stuff like credit card debt with a 20 to 25% annual percentage rate is going at the top. And then maybe if you got a home back in 2021, like when I got one, my mortgage has a two handle on it. I'm staying in that thing forever. (laughs) Okay. I'm slow rolling that payment. But those can be at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, federal student loans with a 4% interest rate can be at the bottom. You know, if you got a home recently, it's a 7%. Car loans, 9%. It's essentially a stacking wall. And then you pay from top. You make all the minimum payments, Mm -hmm. but then you have any additional funds go towards the top because that'll just help clear your debt in the fastest way while paying the least in interest. Mm -hmm. And we all love paying less in fees. We move into our retirement. Listen, I know... Everybody listening to this is a different age in their life, but at some point, it would be really nice to retire. It would be really nice to go swimming in my pool on a Tuesday at 2 p.m. and drink some lemonade. And you don't get to do that unless you have money set aside for future you. So with retirement, I highly recommend folks open up retirement accounts, whether that be employer-sponsored ones, such as a 401k, 403b, 457, TSP, whatever. They're all letters. I was going to say, a lot of initials there. (laughs) A lot of of letters, a lot of numbers, but essentially they're accounts where you get tax benefits for taking care of future you, Mm. as well as individual retirement accounts, both of the traditional and Roth IRA variety. Um, These are great ways to really just set yourself up for success in the future. And I, it is not enough to just put cash into these accounts. Some people do that and they're like, okay, I open the account, I put the cash in, I'm done. No, 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 no. That cash is just sitting there in cash. That's not doing anything for you. You actually need to invest. And investing your money is the part where you actually choose stuff to buy. This is very scary for some folks. What I highly recommend is looking into target date retirement funds as well as index funds that just track the broader market. And if you're really, really stressed, you're like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to spend the time or the brain power. Just utilize a robo-advisor. You take a quick quiz about your money goals, how much you have, how much you earn, what your happily ever after looks like, what you think you know is going to happen for you in the future. Do you want a family? Where you want to live? They spit out a portfolio of diversified investments that's going to make sense for you. Where Easy is that, Lisa? A robo-advisor. You can literally just search best robo-advisors and look through which ones platforms you like the best. Um, and then P. This is my favorite one. You have to plan. You have to make a plan for the future because all of our happily ever afters look very different now. Some people want to retire at 30 and live in an RV. Not me. I don't want an RV life. Uh, Some people want to have a more traditional retirement where they can help their kids with college or have a vacation home or Mm -hmm. travel all around the world. Whatever it is, make sure that you are able to calculate what a year would look like for you, what that would cost, 
and then divide it by 0.04. Why is that? Because that helps you calculate your FU number. <laughs> no, I love it. Explain what an FU number is. Yeah. So an FU number is essentially the amount of money that you would need to have invested to tell your boss FU because you would never need to work for money ever again. And there's a big distinction. I think even once I hit my FU number, I'll keep working, but I won't be working for money. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be working for me. I'm going to want to do the things, every single thing I sign up for. If I don't want to do it, I'm not doing it. Too bad, so sad. Because that 0.04 number represents 4%. And when you think about how much you would need in a year and then divide it by 4%, you are going to get a larger number. Once that larger number of money is invested, getting a conservative return of 4% and, you know, high yield savings accounts right now are offering 5%. So that's risk free. A standard, you know, diversified portfolio that tracks the S&P 500 would return 8 to 10% a year. So 4% is very conservative. Your investing would make enough money every single year to offset what your costs would be every single year. To never touch the principal, the original nest egg. Mm -hmm. So that money could just keep making you money year after year, year after year. You get to live your life, kick your feet up, and do whatever you want. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Girl, that was so amazing. Honestly, I'm so glad that you took us through that because I want people to have that tactical thing that they can go to in knowing that if they strip, they no longer have to exactly. either worry about or, you know, hopefully be in a relationship that is not right for them. Never fear about... Um, you know, breaking up in a relationship because the partner controls the money, never having to uh, lower your standards or lower your worth. Be high value. Be high value, exactly. So thank you so much for doing that. And then your book is just incredible. Where can people find you? The incredible content. Homie, you're like on fire. Thank Where you. can people find all of that stuff um, if they want to learn more about you? Yes. You can find me as Your Rich BFF across all social media. And you can grab a copy of my book at richaf.me. Yes, I made the URL a manifestation <laughs> because why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> and I want people to really pick up this book and read it from page one to the very last page and walk away feeling more confident, capable, and ready to take on their financial journey. Hell yeah. If you want to beat imposter syndrome, build your freaking confidence and feel worthy, then keep watching. So what I realized was I've naturally always been able to recognize what I'm good at and feel comfortable knowing what I'm good at because the way I see it is I'm really good at things that I've really worked hard to be good at. I wasn't naturally gifted in many different areas. Um, what made that difficult was some people don't like it mm -hmm. when you say good things about yourself and it makes them uncomfortable. Particularly in British culture. culture. Yeah. And so I'd have certain friends, friends that would tell me I'm big headed because I would say certain things like that or I was full of myself. And for a while that really weighed on me and for a while I would start to diminish things that I thought I'd done a really good job at. You know, when you come out of a test in, in university and you no, you crushed it. <laughs> but then your friends are like, how did that go? Oh, I was terrible. You can't, I, I kind of get in the habit of being like, yeah, me too. Oh. Just because I knew if I said something like, oh, no, I absolutely crushed it. Oh, well, we'll see. You're full of yourself. And it took me a long time to get into the, the space of, do you know what? The people around me that actually matter will celebrate that I'm celebrating myself. And if they don't, mm. I can't be around them. And that was really hard because a lot of the time, those people you really love and you really care about, but at some point in your life, you have to stop caring what people think and value yourself and your happiness and your peace above that, which is a lot easier to say than done. And I think for me, I'll share like a different perspective because that wasn't my natural, that wasn't my natural journey. I was very much more play it down. Like I remember several times during my later school years where I would sabotage myself because I didn't want people to know that I was good at things or mm. I didn't want like that um, attention that came with it. And I remember um, my G getting my GCSE results. Um, I think I got like five A stars and oh, four Jesus. A's. But I was so embarrassed. I didn't tell anyone. I was like, oh my goodness, my friends are going to hate me. You were embarrassed that you did well? Yeah, the same. I got a distinction in my degree and my friend who was above me in the register. So they didn't, they put it in um, alphabetical order. Um, so she saw what mine was and I got a distinction. And she turned around to me and said, 
oh, you fucking got a distinction, you bitch. Was she serious wow. or was it like, oh, yeah, no, bitch, you got it? Deadly serious. And I was like, so I don't want to, it is so hard to come across people who live in abundance where they're like, do you know what? If someone does well, that doesn't take away from me. And I wasn't around people who did praise themselves. But then when I met Natalie and she would say things like, hey, look at this. I've just done such a good job with this. I was like, wow, how nice that I actually get, I, I was I was feeling mm. in abundance and I could celebrate her. I couldn't celebrate myself at that point, but I could celebrate her because I didn't feel like just because she was good at something, it was taking away from me. I was like, yeah, go you. Like there's plenty, there was no limit to distinctions in the, school, the university. <laughs> anyone could have got a distinction. Like I wasn't taking it from anyone. I just earned it. And I think that's the same thing that, you know, we have with our relationship, you're not taking away yeah. from me when you're doing well. In fact, you're adding to my life, quite frankly, because we're in business together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not like, yeah, you nailed it. But so many, so I, I like... need to just stop there for a second because so many people don't see it like that. And that's why I really want to hammer home that so many people allow that. And I was one of them because I was so um, insecure myself that that's how I'm, I can say this is that once upon a time, that would have made me feel worse. I wouldn't have been able to see the great. I wouldn't have been able to see the amazing thing of having Natalie as a partner. Yeah. All I would have seen is how badly you make me feel because mm. I'm, I can't compete with you because I'm not as good. Yeah. How did you get over that? Working myself, my mindset, yeah. it, 100% was stop looking outwards. Like, you can't control how other people are. And I think it's a real difference between jealousy and envy. I think envy can be super empowering. I can look at someone and go, oh my God, look what, like I can look at your guys' brand and be so like mm. envious of how beautifully big it is and like the amount of women you're impacting. That motivates me. Yeah. Or I can choose jealousy that sits there seething going, these fucking bitches, like I can't fucking believe they're taking all the women from me, right? Like yeah. that, that's like a choice that you can have as a mindset. Yeah. So I just go internally and use it as a power but that's been a lot of growth yeah. mindset And we, we have a quote, which we've always said at Boss Babe when we use externally and, and internally, and that is like collaboration over competition. Mm. So we choose to collaborate versus be in competition with each other. And that's why like every single Friday, we have a meeting with the whole team where they share one thing that they're great, for, grateful for in their lives, whether it's like personally or professionally, and then they celebrate someone on the team. They have to pick someone. There's like enough for every, everyone to go around, you know? Mm. And what's really interesting, um, when we started doing these calls, we would notice how much some of our team would struggle with receiving. Ooh, yeah. And so often you'll find there's a theme. So one person might probably get celebrated by multiple people that week because their works really stood out. And in the beginning, we'd notice they're uncomfortable. They're like looking away, they're laughing, like really struggling to receive. But seeing the progression of the team, people can really own it now when they sit and they're like smiling and they're listening and really taking it in. And I think that's also a really interesting practice to be able to really receive compliments. Like how often when someone compliments, oh, that dress is amazing. Oh, thanks. It was on sale. Yeah. Whatever we yeah. do to kind of shut it down. Mm -hmm. What if you reframe your mindset and you're like, okay, first I'm going to start with receiving. So every time someone compliments me, oh, your hair looks amazing. Even if you don't think it does, just say thank you and just take that and, and go on with your day. And getting into that habit will start to change that internal uh, na narrative. And I actually think that's, uh, you've just reminded me, that's something I actively had to do. And yeah, I would encourage did. any listeners to, if you are like that, someone would say to me, my, like, oh, your hair looks nice, but I washed it. You would just throw it back at them. Mm -hmm. It's like uncomfortable to like f have someone tell you that you're good at something or yeah. you look nice. So if anyone's like watching this or listening to it and going, oh, that's me, like that's like part of the change now. Because I, I think if you struggle, to receive it's actually very hard you know just going back to our beginning conversation around growing in business or learning stuff like you actually repel that too mm -hmm, because yeah. you're just not good at receiving anything knowledge money love any of it and so if you can start rewiring that pattern then it has a knock-on effect and a positive ripple effect in so many other parts of your life. Also, you then start noticing how much you want to give it to other people. Mm -hmm. And then that starts benefiting them. Like I remember literally my whole entire family, we never ever used to say love you on the phone, ever. You would just be like, oh yeah, bye. That was it. And then I just started one day, like, I don't know, they had a boyfriend at the time, he used to say it. I was like, four, I don't know, like 14, 15. 
He goes, you say love you. And I just started saying it to my family. And then my grandparents would like say it. And then my mum and my grandma had never said that on the phone to each other. And they started saying it. And I was like, wow, look at this positive ripple effect. Now mm. you cannot jump on the phone with any of my family without them being like, love you, bye. Mm. <laughs> so you're saying it becomes this knock on effect yeah. that almost gives other people permission mm. to then do it and say it and feel it. Yeah, with all of those things. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just like you're telling your family you love you, is that what you guys are finding with your business, with your team, that by staying true to who you are, by saying out loud that you are proud of yourself, you're noted, noticing this ripple effect, but then how also are they taking that? So let's say you're complimenting them. How, are they, how is that actually benefiting how they show up every day, their work? Um, are you noticing a knock-on effect there? Massive, absolutely massive. People really like to be recognised and, you know, we often think that people might be getting enough of it somewhere else, but let's think about work. How much of your time, your life you spend at work, if you're not being recognized there, you can't go home and tell your partner every single thing that you did and they can't really recognize you for it. So I think at work especially, it's so, so important to be able to call out when someone is doing something good mm. or you see them really making an effort. Because what we have noticed on the other side, um, and you've probably noticed this too, you know when someone's having a bad week and then you're kind of, you point out that they've done a few things wrong mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they get into a spiral yeah. that is very difficult to pull them out of. Yeah. You can create the positive version of that. You can hype them up. You can get them feeling really good about themselves. You can point out what they're really good at. And it really, really does make a massive difference. Also, there's a research, another research study that showed the people were, if, you, if the employees were happiest, they would score higher in productivity. Mm. So the happier employees are, the harder they work, the more productive they are too. Yeah, God, that's so apparent. And in fact, when we were at Quest, um, the company just got so big so quickly, it was really hard to have one-on-one -on -one contact with people and know, like, are you actually satisfied? Are you happy? And so we, the metric we started to judge it by was laughter. Mm -hmm. And we literally said how much, like, it gets like a weird vibe. And you're like, this weird vibe, like, what is it? And you realize no one's laughing. Mm -hmm. Like it is that one little thing. And so knowing that, and I love, you know, we're so freaking tactical. That's why I freaking love you guys. But like almost like Im implanting moments of laughter in your day mm -hmm. to bring a different vibe. Because I, I personally definitely get in my own head about whether I can achieve something, whether I'm good enough. And so I'm always, how do I flip this? How do I change this voice? How do I make it positive? How do I make it work for me? And so um, that's really like one thing that I kind of focus on every day in doing. Um, I, I love that. Yeah, we could think about how to yeah. implement that, especially in a remote team too. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important, especially when you start a meeting, it can be like you get on Zoom, it can be really tempting to like jump into your agenda, but just taking some time to see what everyone got up to at the weekend. I think sometimes it can be a little bit hard to get people talking, but as soon as you do, people are laughing and having fun together. Mm -hmm. That's really productive too. And so making sure you have time for that, I think is so important. And in our relationship, there would be times where we realize in weeks we haven't had like what we call friendship chats or friendship mm. calls where it's not business but definitely one thing that Danielle helped me learn a lot was just being more open about my emotions I historically have not been whereas Danielle's a lot more in tune with her emotions <laughs> and there'd be times you know we hop onto a call and okay I'm bringing the agenda up and I'm just hammering through them and Danielle would read like mm, she's a little bit off mm. and she would just stop things and be like are you okay and then I would just have a meltdown because I've just been bottling everything up <laughs> And all of a sudden you realize, wait, if I just addressed how I was feeling mm. or what was going on for me, then the other person wouldn't have to sit and read between the lines and wonder, did they do something wrong? It's like, and it's so much nicer to just be able to open up and lead with how you feel. Yeah. And I feel like too, you, our communication has gotten more efficient over time. Oh, so yeah. in the beginning, we didn't know how to have conflict with each other. And so it would take a long time of like, finally bringing it up and then navigating like each other's, it could take an hour to have one conversation. Whereas now, and crucial conversations are important in every single relationship. Now, you know, there might be something that I've done that really bugged Danielle. And where in the past, bringing that to a conversation might have taken us both an hour to navigate. Now it's very much, she'll call me in the moment and it's 10 minutes and it's done. And same with me and me the other way around. And that's because we've learned each other. And also I think because we've, did, we've done our own work, whereas before we would probably bring that up in a very 
a very uneducated way. It was like, you said this and you made, you made me feel mm, like right. this, right? Which is very triggering them for the other person because they feel like they've done something wrong. Whereas now it's like, hey, when you said this, a story I'm telling myself is this. So can we talk about that? Like, so it, it's a completely different angle. And so again, like, you know, as I spoke about earlier, it's like, you have to take responsibility for your words, your actions, everything. If you want to change your life, if you want to do something new, if you want to, if you don't like the situation in, you have to take responsibility. And we both took responsibility in our relationship for being like, hey, like these bits are amazing. This bit is where we need to do work. How can we both come together and be like, okay, I can own this part. You can own that part. Mm-hmm. Let's go away. Let's do the work and let's resolve how we move forward so when we have these challenges. And now we'll literally have like, if we have, it's probably like six minutes, we can turn something in and out. In and out. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cause we just, it's just, you know, practice and we're each responsible that's a big difference yeah and the great thing is you know just because say you say something that or say someone says something to you that really upsets you and you bring it up and you tell them the story they might still really stand by what they're saying and they you might have completely different opinions Mm. but being able to hear each other and validate okay i i really validate your experience and mine's very very different being able to both own that and not let it get between you, I think is really, really important. Oh, let's go deeper. Give me the real tactical things about that. You said a couple of words that you, you know, change. You made me feel like this, which is making blame. Like that's the sort of thing, guys, that I honestly think can make or break a relationship, mm-hmm. a partnership, a friendship, a business, where it's like you just let your feelings get in the way. Yeah. And like when I started Quest, like I had zero confidence in myself. So my feelings were all that was present. And so whenever people ask me about my transition from going into business, I was like, the actual act of learning how to grow a business, to do a P&L, to manage a shipping department, all of that shit. Like there are YouTube videos and Google that you can do for it. But how the hell to manage your emotions when you're in a discussion where someone's triggering you, where someone's making you feel badly about yourself. That's the shit where I'm like, that can literally stop you in your path. So how do you, what other things um, can you give as advice that you guys have done over the time that has taken the feeling and emotion out of it in order for you to build like the freaking amazing company that you guys have built? One thing that Natty and I always remember about each other is that we both have good intentions. Mm. So what I mean by that is if Natalie upsets me, let's say she says something and I'm really offended or I'm upset by something she says, right? My personal process is I take a step back. I, I rarely say anything there and then. I'm much more of a like, a, I'll go away and process my own feelings and try and understand if I even need to say anything because that's the other thing. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you don't even need to bring it up. It's actually all on you because she stepped on that little child that I had inside me, which is coming through from my childhood, which is actually nothing to do with her. And when you step back at it and you actually look at the words written down without like, you're like, actually, was that offensive or not? Mm. No, it wasn't. I've processed it. I know that I have a trigger here and I need to go and deal with that. So here's an example. I used to think the word no was such a bad word. So when I was a kid, my parents were like, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do this. Mm. Like, and I would have like a visceral reaction to being told no as if I'd done something wrong. And when I first met Natalie, She's a challenger and eight on the Enneagram. No is my favorite word. It's her favorite word. <laughs> the and I love how you're always very so like non, you're like, no. Yeah, she's like, yeah, do you want to go no here? No. <laughs> can we, do you want to do this? No. Can we, and then, so it would be like, can we do this in the business? Or like, I have this idea. Do you like it? No. I would be like, so triggered. Like I've done something wrong. She's not my idea. I've done something wrong. I'm not worthy. All these things. And so I'd have this spiral. Um, and we went on this walk and talk and I was like, hey, I've, I've realized something that I want to share with you. And I didn't say to her, hey, when, like you're saying no is really like horrible. I don't like it. I was like, hey, I realize I actually have a real like sensitivity around the word no, and I'm trying my best to work through it. In the meantime, I would love your support with it. And she was like, yeah, absolutely. She was like, oh my God, I must've been triggering you left, right and center. I was like, yes, you were. So it was like this, like one, she was, I, I came in and I wasn't saying she did anything wrong and knew it was on me. I was taking responsibility, but then she was also mm. kind enough to be like, hey, I'll actually change that for you. Like, what would you like me to say in the meantime? Does this work? Does that work? And I was like, yeah, those words are perfect. I was like, it's not gonna be like this forever, but I'm just working on it. And then right now I'm really sensitive about it. Mm. So if you can help me in that, and just like that whole thing was that like we both had good intentions. like. I knew like 
you know, we always say boss baby is our baby and we want to do best by the baby, right? So I knew that she would like, knew that helping me and supporting me this would make her life easier <laughs> in the long term. But I think it's just being receptive to those things. Do you have any you want to share? Yeah, I, that's definitely a big one is in relationships, being able to create a safe enough space where you mm-hmm. can be really open because I feel like we're constantly learning things about ourselves and having new conversations and saying, oh, this is an edge for me or I'm learning this about myself mm-hmm. or I need support here. And having that safety is really, really important, which we've been able to build over time. Like, I feel like there's nothing we can't talk about. And then if you're in a conversation, like when Danielle was saying, coming to the conversation saying, when this happened, the story I told myself was, firstly, you're not putting the blame on someone. So that's, that's a really good way of approaching it. And if you're on the receiving end, even if you think their story is crazy and you're like, this is crazy, I don't agree with it. It's really important that you validate their feelings because every single one of us has the craziest stories. Mm-hmm. Like we all have it. And if you think <laughs> you don't, just wait. We all have it. And so it's first really important to say like, thank you for sharing that. So they know, okay, I can come and share things like that again. And then you can say, you know, I'm really sorry, I didn't intend that. Or if you're not sorry, you don't need to say sorry. You just need to go in the direction of, I really maintain what I said. I didn't intend to hurt you. Mm -hmm. And it's really important for me to voice my feelings or whichever direction you take it. But being able to create that safe space and then make sure before you end the conversation, you're both feeling clean about it and there's nothing else. It's so important. And the more of those conversations you have, the easier and quicker they get. My husband, as you guys know, my husband's my business partner and I do the same thing because there is this spillover between personal and business mm. and the trigger thing, like it is insane how, how many women I talk about where their triggers in their personal life does absolutely rear its ugly head in the business world. And so for me, it is multiple things. It's building a habit, right? Because your trigger has become this thing that you've carried with you over time. So to untrigger yourself to work through it becomes a habit and so giving yourself the grace to develop that new habit same with you articulating that I'm not there yet but and I'll give myself the pat on the back and I was like remember like three weeks ago it took me you know 24 hours and now I just recognized it in two days in, in two hours it gives me the my own credibility that you're yeah. on the right path don't yeah. be yourself up for not being there but give yourself the pat on the back that you're trying to get there And then the second part is I don't always take my feelings as truth. Mm. Well, that's a good one. Meaning, and you you obviously have really suffered with health like myself and um, that it came from my health issues because I realized one day I was at Quest and, you know, we'd worked a couple of years. It was, you know, huge at this point. And we had this big meeting and Tom, my business partner, or at the time he was more like my boss, he turned to me and said something and I got so upset. And it was the first time I ever cried at work. And I ran into his bathroom after the meeting was like over. I ran into his bathroom and he was like, what the hell? So he walks in. This is years into the business, guy. And he walks in and he's like, babe, is everything all right? I was like, you were so mean to me. (laughs) And he's like, what the fuck is happening? (laughs) He's like, my wife never cries crying at work and she said i'm being mean to her like that has taken the business into the personal space and because i trusted him he was able to say to me this is against your character now once i had that insight i started to really look at my hormones and Mm -hmm. i really started to look at how i eat how much i sleep like all these things that actually contribute to my belief in myself to my confidence to show up, to my belief in taking a criticism, like literally just how I feel with my hormones will allow me to either take a criticism and go, thank you for that, or be completely broken by so that true. criticism. That other layer to There's being a certain woman. time of the month, you just don't <laughs> criticize someone. Right. You just save it. <laughs> so talk to me about that. Have you guys found that how you live in your lifestyle has had a knock-on effect in your confidence in your business? Um, and what those things are, like, again, I'm always looking for tips and takeaways. Um, what what things have you guys done? 1,000%. So for me, what's firstly really important is sleep. I don't compromise my sleep. I'm not the kind of person that will pull an all-nighter. It just doesn't work for me. When I sleep well, I work so much better. Blood sugar. So I wear my mm. CGM all the time. Tracking my blood sugar, I would say, is the number one thing that healed my hormones completely. Um you know, I felt like I could never get to the bottom of what was happening with my hormones. And when I found out about the role that blood sugar plays in your overall health, it changed everything for me. And it's really important that you're managing your blood sugar on a, like on an hourly basis, because it affects how you show up at work. If you have a breakfast that then sends you into a crash, you're not going to have a productive morning. If you have a lunch that sends you into an afternoon slump, you're going to want to nap, not 
you know, write some copy. Same thing. So thinking about the journey that your energy is going on throughout the day, blood sugar is really the foundational element of that. So that's been incredibly important. Can I add one thing to that yeah. as well that I've actually found is yeah. that um, high levels of um, sugar makes me more anxious. Mm, yes, and because caffeine. it makes you feel and caffeine because it yeah. makes you jittery. Sure. And so going into a meeting, right, or you're especially like if you're a meeting that you're not confident in, right, yes. where you're like, I have to keep my cool, I want to show up, like I, I really want to give it my all, and you're freaking shaking because you just pounded a cake and freaking yeah. coffee on the way to the the meeting. Yeah, that's a recipe for disaster. No one's going to show up well. So those two things being really, really important, and then third, having a practice that helps you ground mm. and be in a good space. So for me, one thing that I do is I live by my calendar, but I block out my lunch every single day in my calendar and I make sure I'm not eating my, at my desk or I'm eating in meetings. I'm actually sitting down having my lunch and I'll often go on a walk. And that just helps me make sure I'm in a really, really good state for when I'm taking meetings or working. And that's the whole thing we're talking about. When you prioritize yourself, you show up in a totally different way. Yeah, I agree. I mean, obviously my background was health anyway, so I always spoke to Natalie about like the holistic side to doing business almost because you know I, I say this quite over and over again but I genuinely like believe this and live by it it's like you're only successful as you're going to be mentally and physically capable of being so you're right like look understanding your hormones I always think I've used this word a lot on this podcast which I'm kind of like reflecting on but I think there's this responsibility piece mm. a lot of people give the responsibility of their health away to practitioners, surgeons, someone else, just not them. And I think we're past that now. I think everyone, if, they, if you wanna be successful, if you wanna be your best self, if you wanna be feeling at your best, you have to recognize that you've gotta take responsibility for that. You've gotta be responsibility, take responsibility for checking in with yourself, mm -hmm. listening to your body, being able to put boundaries on, like, you know, Natalie has this boundary around no meetings. Everyone respects it, you know? Like, what what can you do to make sure you are at your best? And then putting those things in place and just recognizing, and a lot of the times, like, it's not even the complicated stuff. You know, Natalie's showing her, like, um, CGM monitor, right? But there's a lot of things that you can do before that. Are you drinking enough water? Are you getting your seven or eight hours sleep? Maybe there's some supplements that you might need to take, whatever it is. But exercising, I feel personally more confident when I exercise. Mm. Um, and just also knowing that it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing process. It's never like, oh yeah, I'm like perfect, perfect health and I'm done. There's always like something you can be improving on, but just taking a bit of responsibility mm. for it. I think it's really important. I love that. Like my morning routine as well is the thing that sets me up for confidence in all yeah. day. Like it doesn't matter what thing that I may be anxious about or what I'm about to do that day. It's like having that me time, um, it's so important, but I think that, and I don't know if you guys feel like this, it feels like I've come to this conclusion all in hindsight. So you've got people mm -hmm. at home right now that are just like, I want to build, I want to do great things, I don't have the confidence, how do I build my confidence, let me work on myself. And then you come to a point where your health sometimes does come into conflict with the time that you're going to work on your business. And I've heard you guys talk about being unapologetically you, and you very, um, Natalie, speaking very eloquently about how you've had to reshape your life to put yourself first. How did you do that? Because the amount of people right now that I think are just being like, well, it's okay for you guys. It's freaking difficult. Yeah. But I actually understand what they're saying. That The more successful you get, the easier somewhat it is to make more demands of your own personal time. But in the build up, it is actually very hard. So in everything we're talking about, when we all know the health leads to the confidence, the confidence leads to us stepping up and building the business or the life that we want. But now if you backtrack, how the hell do you do that in the first place when you don't have the confidence to necessarily put your health first because you think that that's actually going to be detrimental to what you're trying to do? I think that's such a good question. And I think about, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, if you're in the early stages of trying to get a business off the ground and you're worried about paying rent, you're worried about not being able to afford food, thinking about buying organic food is probably not even an option for you. Right. And you're listening to people talking about it and you're like, yeah, sounds good. Do you have no idea where I'm at? I think that's really important to acknowledge. Um, especially I think about when I was first building my first business, I lived off like cup of noodles and they were not the healthiest things, but I was doing little things. I was trying to get out for walks. I was not sleeping great. But as you start to move up Maslow's hierarchy and you start to get your foundational needs in place, okay, I can pay my rent this month. Okay, I can actually afford to eat a little bit better. Mm. Things start to free up and you do get to 
create some mind space to think about fulfillment and health and all of those other areas of your life but when you're in a survival phase I think it's very very difficult mm. and I think that's important mm. to acknowledge if you are in that phase where like we've talked about it before would we have necessarily gotten our business to the point it is now had we not pulled those really late nights those 80 hour weeks I don't think we would have guys this is the truth talk right yeah. here because I don't know what to do or say because you're 1000 yeah. percent right but also that was the cause of my health issues and yeah yeah, and I think there's there's things you can do in that you do the best with what you can. You try and get the sleep that you can. You make time to go outside. You, If you're working out, making time for that. I always made time for my workout no matter what. So I would get up and I would work at 6 a.m. every single day. And I freaking hated it. Every single day I hated it. I'd be doing, I hate this, I hate this. But after I finished, I'd feel so much better. And then I'd jump into work. I'd be like starting to do messages around 6.30 a.m. So I could get that handover time with Danielle. That was really important. And I'm really glad that I put the time in. I'm glad that I still made time to exercise and it made a big difference. And I'm glad that I put the time in. Yeah, I think it's important to accept there are seasons of your life that are absolute shit shows. <laughs> I'm just going to put it out there. No. Like no, I'm going to vote way more eloquently. <laughs> No, there are seasons of your life where you have different things that you're focused on. Yeah. And I do think that's uh, really important. But actually, I mean, like, just own it, right? If there are yeah. seasons that are shit shows, how do you actually get yeah. through the shit show so that you can show up for the good season? Yeah, and I honestly, I think it comes back around to all of these. It's like, okay, well, this is where I'm at really, right now. It's really freaking hard. But I also know it's a season, seasons pass, they mm. come and go, like my life isn't gonna be like this forever. That I think gives you strength. And okay, I can't control all these other things, but what are the things that I can control? And quite often I do think like, you know, your routine is the easiest thing to control quite often. You know, whether you are suffering health challenges or whether you're suffering mental challenges or whether you're like busy in work, not busy in work, you're but 10 kids at home, whatever it is. Like, I think if you can try and have some form of routine for yourself that you ground in every day, that makes everything else that little bit easier, mm. you know? But it's like what you choose to sacrifice. Like, I, I really mm. tried my very best not to sacrifice my health. Yeah. Like, I really did. You like, did a really good I job of that. I tried to work out and I always ate well. Like, I didn't go into the takeouts. Like, I always made sure I cooked. So those were my, like, I. I was so adamant and holding on to those things, but I never watched TV in the end. I basically stopped socializing with my friends. Holidays were coming out to LA. Like I didn't have a holiday for two years. I would come out here and work. So there's like, I think you get to choose. There's always a little bit of choice of what you can sacrifice and what you can't. Oh, I love that. And actually I wrote down, I want to talk to you guys about FOMO because I'm really was going through what are all the things that really help that, that hold people back. And when I think about my own story, it really was the fear of missing out with all my friends, right? Mm. It's, I'm on a Saturday night in a freaking hairnet and sweatpants and sneakers, making protein bars by hand. And you know, my friends are going to the club, they're going to the bars or in not even anything that extreme. They were going to Starbucks for coffee and I was just saving every penny I had. So I would either say no to go into Starbucks or take my own homemade coffee with me. That was really hard emotionally mm. to decide that I was putting my dreams and goals ahead of um, hanging out with my friends. Did you guys have that FOMO? Because I really do think, again, that this is one thing that can hold women back from actually living the life they want. I have to be honest, I don't have FOMO so much because whatever I'm missing out on is a choice. And really, when I dig into it, I'd so much rather be doing what I'm doing. And so there's you know, if I'm not going to certain events, I might see it on Instagram and part of me is like, oh, it'd be really nice to be with everyone. And would I trade it for the situation I'm in right now? Absolutely not. And so I remind myself mm -hmm. of that. Like, I love an early bedtime. So I might go out with friends. I went out recently for a friend's birthday and I was very clear on my boundary of, hey, I'm going to be leaving at 10. I have no interest in going to the club. It doesn't light me up. And me and my husband went home. We had a great sleep. I woke up the next day. We were hearing everyone's stories of how fun it was and all the stuff they got up to. And I was able to really enjoy that for them and be really grateful with the decision that I made. Mm -hmm. I know that I am so happy when I feel good. And so the things that I miss out on to feel good are totally worth it. Yeah, I was trying to think about this. Like, I feel like I'm 
been so laser focused in creating my dream and my vision that I just nothing uh, competes with that. Yeah, nothing. Like I, I, I can still find time to socialize and do those things when I want to, and also say no when I don't. But I think for me, like if people talk, like Simon Snake talks about your why. My why has got me through mm. so much. Like if I stop and think about it, um, the why, why we show up for Boss Babe every day, the impact that we have on women who are building wealth for themselves, their family, we're changing generations. I don't give a shit about that coffee. Like I, it just doesn't even come on my radar I totally get that that's not the case for everybody else or like some people, but I think when you do have that why, it does become it easier to say mm -hmm. no or to be clear on what your yeses and what your noes are. I actually heard Raddy talk about this on a social media post that she did. Um, and she was like rewiring like, oh, I have to or I get to. Mm. And I was like, damn, like, yeah, you get to have the choice of whether you go to coffee or not. Yeah. Like, thank goodness you have friends who want to have coffee with you and you get to have a business. Mm. So which do you want to do on this day? Sometimes I'm all for going for coffee with a friend. I'm like, yeah, I need out of this business right now. <laughs> I've been on too many Zoom calls and I want to go. No offense, even though you're messy. <laughs> yeah. But like other times I'm like, no, I'm like loving this right now. I'm really yeah. busy. I'm on this project. Like I've got a bit of momentum. I don't want to leave my desk. Like I'm really in it and I'm enjoying it. Have you guys heard of the um, the marshmallow experiment? No. So it's this, they did this experiment years ago and they put a bunch of kids and they tell the kid, they put a kid by a table and they're like, here's a marshmallow. We're going to leave the room. If you don't eat that marshmallow, when I come back, I'm actually going to give you another one. But if you eat the marshmallow, then I'm not. And so what they did is they put these kids in and they saw how many kids ate the marshmallow and then they tracked them for like 30 years. And all the kids that didn't eat the marshmallow, it was something, I'm going to make up a percent, but it was something like 10 times they were more successful than the people that ate the marshmallow when they were first wow. given it. Because it's the short-term satisfaction versus the long-term satisfaction. Yep. It's the people that like, I want to freaking eat ice cream all day, every day. But A, I know my stomach's going to hurt, so I don't bother. But then also I know that that doesn't serve the bigger goal that I have of being healthy and, you know, building muscle or whatever, getting strong. So um, I think everything you said, you guys are definitely yeah. will wait for the marshmallow. You would never eat it. Oh, no, I would, if I was oh, told I would wait for weeks. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. there's that saying, choosing an easy life now leads to a hard life later. Mm. And choosing a hard life now leads to an easy life later. And think about that with retirement. Like, you know, working hard now, saving money, is gonna give you an easier retirement versus, you know, not necessarily working so hard, not saving or, you know, living a lifestyle where you're like spending a lot of money now, is gonna lead to a harder life later. Mm. So it's that kind of same kind of concept. And um, talk to me about money. Because that's the one thing yes, that, oh, talk about it. yeah, but, but seriously, I mean, in fact, we just had a conversation recently about this, that how, it is, I was taught that you don't talk about money, that especially as a woman, you never ask, you never tell people how much money, you never tell people how successful you are. And to the point where my entire life, I was, as we were building Quest, it was like very exciting. I was giving up so much, going back to sacrifice, sacrificing a lot. And in those sacrifices, I was telling myself, one day, Lisa, you're going to be able to like walk into a Starbucks and buy three, three cups of coffee and not worry about the price. Yeah, one day, Lisa, you're going to buy those Louboutins that you really freaking love. And then eventually you get there and then it becomes going back to like, is it boasting? Is it gloating? We've been taught when we shouldn't talk about money, we shouldn't talk about success. So all these things that have driven you, you, I at least felt guilty about even talking about them after. So talk to me about that and what you guys have found um, with women in talking about money, owning how much money they're making um, and being able to talk about it without worrying or being perceived that we're bitches um, or gloating or things like that. I think it kind of comes back to what we were talking about when we were saying, you know, um, when you celebrate yourself, the people around you that shun you for that probably aren't the people that you want to be around. It's very similar with money. Mm -hmm. um, and what do they say? You, you earn the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So it is actually really important that you are curating the right circle. And if you're also around people that tell you you're greedy or why do you want more? Why are you not satisfied? they might not be the right people to be making millions around because they'll always have an answer for what you're doing. They'll always find a way to put you down. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important. Be around people where you know it's safe to be able to talk about that. 
Secondly, women just don't own it. For some reason, um, it's looked down upon to want to make money. Money is incredible. Money gives you access to so many things. Money, you know, gives you access to be able to change things in the world, to change people's lives, to create experiences. No, it doesn't make you happy, but it definitely helps. When you're not having to worry about your medical bills, when you can buy the most expensive supplements or organic food that you desire, when you can create experiences for your family to come together and have memories for life, money is really, really important. When you can see a cause that you really care about and be able to contribute in a meaningful way without feeling like that's a real drain on you, that's incredible. And if if women are serious about building wealth, it's important to really acknowledge that and claim that and not be ashamed to talk about it. Yeah. I get so revved up about this. Yeah, like, we love this. For me, the more money women make, the better we're doing our job at Boss Babe. Like That's mm. what it's about. It's about like how can we help you take ownership of your financial position and the first thing I would say though about money is you have to recognize that you have a money mindset and understand what that is and it sounds like crazy but when I first learned about this I was I bought this like money course I can't even remember what it was a money mindset course and it was like write down all the stories that you have about money mm. and I was like writing stuff down and I was like this is so weird and I wrote down there like oh men always earn more than women I had that story because that's what I'd seen growing up. Money um, made you kind of like a bad person. If you got money, you were kind of like not a great person because I just remember like these two wealthy, like rich guys that I'd known, like I was like, they were just not amazing people. And I remember hearing my mum and dad say stuff about them. And like, so I just had this narrative that like, okay, like that's what happens. And, you know, also like money is really hard. Money is, does not grow on trees. It's really hard to come by. All of these, all of these like, you know, I guess you could call it like beliefs. I had this belief system. Mm. And I think what's really important is that, you know, a lot of women and men will have belief systems, but they'll be different. My belief system growing up with an average family in the UK is going to be very different to somebody who literally grew up with like water being turned off or you know, never knowing if when they were going to get fed. And likewise, that belief system is going to be different from somebody who grew up, you know, getting bought a Range Rover for their 16th birthday. You know, mm -hmm. it's very different. You look at money differently. And I think, first of all, acknowledging that and that you get to change your narrative around money, you get to learn about money and you get to understand how other people people use money is part of the process and I think until we start acknowledging it as an education like you have mm. to educate yourself on money you have to educate that it's an energy that it moves like it's basically just a piece of paper which has a value on that we decide what that value is and so like when you start breaking those things down I think that then one you start losing some of the shame if you do have shame around it in a belief like oh like money's evil or if I have money I'm taking it away from someone else there's not enough money in the world and you can rewire it by actually you know what I choose to have the mindset that the more money I make the more choice I have to do good in the world when I earn this amount of money I want to make sure a big part of it is you know philanthropic. I want to be giving it back. And so I know that if I have this, if the more money I'm making, the more people I'm helping, like whatever the stories are, but just really owning that we get to change the narrative. And then obviously what we do at Boss Babe is like, one, even talking about this. Like it used to be like so cringe mm -hmm. for women to even talk about money. And for someone who's just like gone through a divorce, I think it's so freaking crucial women understand their household income. As women, we spend, we are normally responsible in an average household 80% of what gets spent, right? So like that's like the general statistics that's thrown around. But I love my mom, but I was having a conversation with her the other day because I was doing my will. I was making sure like I knew where, I was setting up trust, doing all these things. My mom was like, oh, I really don't know what's in our bank accounts. My mom does not have access to online bank accounts. She has a bank mm. account in her name. She does not know what's in there. Like my dad owns, like runs all of that. I mean, they've been together 40 years, great. But I was like, mom, like, I love you, but you really, I personally believe everyone, every woman should know. They should have a good baseline education of what money they have in their family. And we should really encourage that. And to be like, if you don't know, that's okay, but go and educate yourself. Um, and like I said, for me, like going through my divorce, it was a really big eye open. I was like, I'm so grateful 
that like my dad did educate me in money. He was an accountant and I was always really good at money. I had a bank account since I was 12 year old. 12 years old and I knew how to take like financial responsibility for myself mm. and never had to ask for a penny from a guy and that was like something I really was like adamant about growing up and you know in my marriage we had separate bank accounts we had our own finances so it meant when there was a breakdown of uh, our divorce I was in a financial position to support myself mm. you know and I think that's just really really important that we get to say like have these conversations it's not dirty to talk about it it's not weird to talk about it like yeah let's own that that's a very powerful word and I actually heard you say in an interview about ambition that both you know and I just think of it as money that we have been trained that um, women and ambition and women and money is a dirty, dirty word yeah, it's a dirty mm -hmm. word which is super interesting because actually I didn't even plan to say this but when you guys came in before we started rolling I even asked you guys hey guys um, you know, you guys are making, you know, your business eight figures now. Are you okay with me even saying yeah. that? And it's interesting that I asked. I'm like, yes! But it's interesting that I asked you. Yeah. Because there was a part of me that is, that knows women are, some women are worried about how much the success or their wealth is creating. Mm. And so there was almost a part of me that was like, well, of course I'm going to respect them by asking them, even though it's on your website. But yeah. like, but it goes to show that even with me, that I had intended to ask you about this question, still even had a filter where I had to check with you guys first. Yeah, what's really interesting is even before this, we were filming, we were talking about different products and launches. And um, one of the questions I was like, oh, how much are you gonna make from yeah. that? And just like, we're very open talking about it and getting into that habit, I think is really important. And of mm. course, there's times when you say, oh, I'm not really comfortable talking about it or I don't know yet. But when you can get comfortable saying, oh, well, I just closed this deal for this amount and it feels really, really good, let's celebrate. Mm -hmm. I think it's important. It's like normalizing, isn't it? Like yeah. normalizing conversations because they were traditionally rude don't get me wrong like in some circles it's still gonna be like that and there's polite ways of saying like yeah. hey do you mind you don't have to tell me but do you mind like i'm really inquisitive about this like that's why we use our platform our podcast we talk about money all the time because it's like you know they're conversations that perhaps people don't necessarily get to have with like their school friends or the people mm. that live in the same town as them. Yep. But hopefully they're exposed via us. They can know like actually there's an open dialogue here and it exposes to people about what they need to know about money. Like if I hadn't, like things are changing right now with crypto as well. Like mm -hmm. some of the rooms I've been in recently, obviously since moving to LA, it's been really eye-opening and I was even talking to my family back home and I was genuinely surprised at how little they knew about crypto, whereas all, all I'm freaking hearing. But if I think about the circles I run in, it's very different to the circles that I used to run in or where my family live and who they're surrounded by right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and these conversations can change your upper limits. So what you might have thought was possible when you have a conversation with someone and they might tell you, say you thought, you know, the max you could make in a launch was 100K and that's like the dream launch. And you have a conversation with someone and they're like, oh, I just made 500K in my last launch. Well, all of a sudden your upper limits went from 100K to 500K and what's available consciously has changed and your goal mm. might change. And I remember, um, when we were starting Boss Babe, my husband being quite pushy on oh, yeah. what our goals were going to be. And I'd initially given him our financial goal and he, he was like, double it. And when you really do change your upper limits, you'll be really surprised what opens up and changes. I love that. Are you guys discussing that with your audience? Because like the upper limit thing, even just this interview alone, I really hope that's exactly what yeah. that's done, right? Is that the people that are watching, whatever they thought was possible, that you guys have just said something that has hit them that is now changing their upper limit. So let's say, for instance, you go, okay, changing my upper limit is powerful because now I can, I can realize what's possible. I can push beyond what I thought. How do you almost force that into your mindset? Like, would you, for instance, like, oh, look at Oprah and go, oh, shit, that's what a freaking host can be, right? And now it's amazing because I've looked for someone that may be doing something that I'm doing and saying what's possible. Do you guys do that? I think for me, it's that's too that's too much. Like, oh. it's too overwhelming for me. That's, like, intimidating. Really? I'm like, oh, my God, I can't even go there. And I, I just want to, you know, from everything that Natalie and I have said today, we're not special people. We're not, you know, geniuses. We're not, uh, like... You know, we're, we're just normal people. We didn't come, we didn't give, be born with silver spoons in our mouth, anything like that. So I have pushed through so many freaking upper limits, whether it being like, okay, I was at university, I just wanted a first job 
And I remember I was like, all I want to earn is £12,000 a year, which was like, what, $15,000, $17,000? That was all. I was like, okay, I just want to earn this. And I got to that. Then it was like, okay, what do I want to get to now? And so, you know, if you told me right from then at university, oh yeah, now dream of moving to LA and having a multi-million dollar business, I'd be like, no, that's too intimidating. That's too much. Like you're off your absolute rocker. I would never be able to do that. But you know, seeing those steps over time, did I have a dream that one day I would have a location free business? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did I have a dream that I would have, you know, financial freedom that didn't mean I was like flying in private jets or on yachts or anything like that. Financial freedom meant to me being able to go on multiple holidays a year if I wanted to, if I was to have kids, put them through like private schools, being able to buy the odd nice handbag. Like those were my dreams. And I think it's like, don't be in it's good to expose yourself and know what's possible and like push those things and each one like go okay I've, I've got this now like oh, what's a little bit more what's the next edge I can go mm -hmm. through which is why this whole you know right from the beginning we're like always working we're always pushing through the next thing because you're do always you, growing do you find that as well the big picture to be overwhelming yeah I think if you're trying to stretch an above limit, I think you have to be able to relate to something in someone. Mm. And so if you're talking about a 100K launch and someone tells you I did a 500K launch, but you have maybe 100 followers and they have 10 million, mm. you're like, well, I see where you're at compared to me, so I don't think I'm there yet. It doesn't make sense. Whereas if you find someone that you can relate to in some way, oh, I'm mm. actually really good at that too, or oh, we have that really similar that similarity thread that you can find, that can help you really stretch your upper limit in a way that logically makes sense. So your emotions are like, yes, I want it. And then logically you're like, oh, that's actually quite possible. I think that's important. And so um, when I'm doing it, I'm seeking out podcasts or books from people that I really look up to and I'm inspired by. And I see something in them that I see in myself too. Mm. Maybe it's their drive, maybe it's their, their childhood where they began. Something that helps me get on their level really, really helps me. If you want to learn how to break the nice girl habits, master your freaking confidence and join the Bad Bitch Club, then click here right now. A lot of people stay in quiet desperation because they get talked out of the thing that deep down inside they know to be true. And they're going to...